Hello again, friends, and you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here on another spring Tuesday afternoon, or early evening, depending on what part of the continental United States you are in. And even the international listeners, we remember you people as well, and your various whacked-out time zones. I am the great Brian Last, your host, and we'll be asking your questions, maybe, but we're going to be hearing a review of the big WrestleMania 37 from none other than the leader of the cult of Cornette, Mr. Jim Cornette. This has been your WrestleMania oh, review oh, oh, for oh, 2021. Oh, 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 wait. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Brian, you remember sleep? You remember what sleep was like? I've heard about that. I was getting, I was just commenting last month on how I hadn't slept so good as the last year when I've been home in my own bed with my own pillow or pillar, as Aunt Lola would say. And, and, and suddenly I can't remember what sleep is like. Not only am I, am I dealing with the action figure onslaught? We'll talk about that in a minute. Not only am I uh, glad to report, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Stacy's feeling better after her surgery. Still, obviously, I'm carrying a lot of things over 10 pounds. Uh, but you also instructed me to watch for the edification, education, enlightenment, and interest of our listeners what passes for Wrestle, WrestleMania these days. WrestleRania. The rain delay was the better, better part of the show. I, no, I shouldn't say that. Because after seeing Sunday, I have a newfound appreciation for Saturday. You know, I came out of Saturday with such a good spirit about things. I was just like, wow, you know, not exactly how I would do things, but this was all right. WWE really does a big show like no one else. And I feel good about things. And then Sunday... Things could turn out all right. And then Sunday, they immediately dragged me back to WWE. <laughs> right back to Greenwich. To show me what's going on in that twisted old mind. But Saturday, I thought, was very uplifting. Wait a minute. Okay. Rocky Ramon, uh, <laughs> Nate, uh, uh, my God, who about uh, our, our uh, uh, talented listeners and talented musicians out there? Einar. Well, maybe not Einar. I don't know if Einar needs to tackle this one, but. Lior. <laughs> or no, I was thinking of Lior. Einar might can do it, but Lior might want to <laughs> stay away from this one. But. You're a mean one, Mr. Greenwich. <laughs> You've got crabgrass in your soul. Oh, boy. Yeah, well, anyway, but this is your show, and who far be it from me. Now, just to let everybody know, uh, another, this is, we're recording this on Monday at, at almost high noon, and this morning, another 200 action figures were shipped out to go along with the nearly 200 that shipped out on Friday. And I'm trying to keep that pace, whereas it's going to be another couple of hundred, maybe 150, because I'm doing this to please everybody else. I'm doing recording this today. So maybe 150 on Wednesday morning, but it's, it's, it's happening. And by the time that uh, uh, you, you folks hear this also, um, you may have seen a picture of, we took another picture of the boxes of action figures stacked up, ready to go to the post office. And it, it, it. <laughs> I don't know what I've gotten myself into. But anyway, I appreciate everybody's patience. As we mentioned on the uh, experience, I'm doing the people that ordered the two packs first because that gets me some more space in the garage and it's quick to put sign two and put two in these boxes that I'm headed toward single uh, action figures of either the original or the variant. Then we're then some of you fine and dedicated People out there bought the action figures and other stuff as well at the same time, and those are going to be a little bit more time-consuming. We're going to try to be getting to those by middle of next week. And then there's those internationals. Those people require extra love at the counter, along with a lot of extra time, and so bear with us on that. But anyway, uh, yeah, so what is that? It makes about around 400 action figures out so far out of... 1970 something so we're we're making progress and in the middle of that thank uh thank again to uh, thanks again to everybody who's wished stace well after her surgery and she's feeling better now 
Uh, it's easier to get up and around. That's This is the point where it becomes dangerous because now she thinks she can start overdoing things, possibly. But uh, but she's feeling better, but I'm still, as I mentioned, lifting everything that, that around the house over 10 pounds. Um, and what else is going on in my life I need to keep people apprised of? Oh know. yes, and and I've and and also uh, yes, Harley Quinn is happy to uh, to report that she's feeling good. Also, she had some sympathy pains for mommy, and she was feeling puny for a couple of days, just kind of moping around. But we we discovered that it's because she has that empathetic sympathy, the the psychic ability to feel when someone because these animals they're they're better than we are, Brian. You know that the animals we don't deserve them. These animals, yeah. The animals of the world, the dogs and the cats and the furry woodland creatures, we don't deserve them. There are no animals you want to hurt? Well, I mean, if it was a like a goddamn vicious, rabid pit bull that was had me up a tree and was going to kill me, I guess I'd take a stick to him or whatever I had to do, but I've really never been mad at an animal. When a raccoon gets in your house, I, I'm curious about your mindset, because it's happened. Is it? I'm going to kill that thing. I need to get it. Or is it, oh, we need to find him a nice home and get him out? No, well, it's a... a Raccoon. I wouldn't go with any of those. First, well, since it happened to me, and, and that story is available on you, one of the YouTube episodes, Um, I was at first, I didn't want to fuck with the raccoon because the, besides the fact that I was in bed, it was three o'clock in the morning, so I was naked. I, I got some clothes once I realized that I was sharing the ho the house with the raccoon, but I, my shoes were on the other side of the raccoon. So barefoot, three o'clock in the morning. Um, I didn't I didn't want to mess with its claws, its fangs, or its potentially rabidness, right? But I wasn't mad at the raccoon because I realized that the raccoon was just trying to find a place to possibly hang out and get something to eat when he pried that attic fan. Uh, grate or vent or whatever off and climbed in and drop kicked my access panel to one of my attics open that now has a fucking bolt lock on it and then once that the the police arrived and and <laughs> didn't take me in for being under the influence of something like they were about to before we actually realized where the raccoon was and they indeed saw the raccoon with their own eyes then i'm like i didn't want them to shoot the th even if they could have shot in the house and and not put holes in my wall or or some of my shit i wouldn't want i just I'd throw the door open chase him out i didn't care what home he got once he was out there i figure he can take care of that for himself he knows more about homes for raccoons out in the wild than i do i'm just i'm just a simple small town bird lawyer but i am the best goddamn bird lawyer in the world but that has nothing to do with raccoons so as long as they chased him out the door, I was happy. And that's what they did. Once he was back out in his part of the, the environment, I wasn't worried about him. But I was pissed when I found out all the things that he shit on, like my drapes and my end table and everything, when, when they scared him by shining the flashlight on him. The little, and he spun around. He looked like the goddamn, what was that, the angry squirrel or the mean mouse or what was that i have was no a chipmunk idea. remember that thing no yes, i don't you do. no I, you no do <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> the fucking it, it the, the video that went around it was one of those memes it was a meme everywhere brian you know the memes and and the fucking animal whatever it was was it a squirrel was it a raccoon was it a i can't remember what it was but it turns around like no 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 with a mean face that's what the raccoon did. When they shined the light on it, it turned around. And went, meow, meow. Do you believe that you'll be able to use your expertise in bird law to help the birds that keep flying out of Matt Riddle's ass? Well, we'll talk about that here shortly as well. That's j I think actually that maybe they do have a case because the more I see of this fucking guy, the less I like him. And I'm thinking that it may be some type of cruelty to animals to to whoever is shoving those birds up his ass also might have a case because not only are the birds being mistreated by being shoved up riddle's ass for the entrance but also unless riddle's doing it himself and i would think that'd be hard to reach and get that accomplished back there they probably got maybe it's the guy that won the world's mars bars ass stuffing contest that they've hired 
since he's a specialist in this endeavor, to shove those birds up Riddle's ass. What do you think? I didn't know we were going to do a call back to that, but sure. Yeah, it could be how it got up there. How they got up there. How it got how they got how how'd you get up there? Shoot up here amongst <laughs> us. One of us needs some relief. <laughs> well, oh. speaking of relief, wrestling fans dying to attend a wrestling event and cross their fingers and hope not to get the coronavirus. We're in attendance for two nights of WrestleMania, and of course. That is the big main event here this week on the show. Do you Jim. think they were even crossing their fingers? I was for them. <laughs> Probably more than well, they were for fuck themselves. Them. I don't cross my fingers for anybody that's doing something stupid. If you're goddamn skydiving or jumping out of airplanes or off cliffs, you deserve what you get. They even have, apparently was there, there was a release or it's on the ticketing or somehow they've, or was this for the UFC? Am I com conflating the two? But I think when UFC put their tickets on sale, there was a, you had to acknowledge that you might catch COVID and die if you're a, a spectator at this event. I'd, I'd check the back of the WrestleMania tickets if I were you guys, because may, they may have passed something by you. When you hand us this ticket for entrance, that means that you can fucking die in the next six months of any goddamn thing, and we're not responsible. But I saw a bunch of people not wearing masks. Almost as good as the contracts with the wrestlers. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get rid of you whenever we want. You have no cause to sue us for anything. Oh, I, I got to dig one of mine up. I think one of the first TBS ones or whatever. It was like, seriously, like if, if you die, if you just die and are killed and we have to fucking carry your remains out on a spatula, we, we are not responsible. <laughs> um, but no, there was a bunch of people not wearing fucking masks. Uh, people clustered up like coils at ringside. There was, I don't know why you would do it. To, to see this also. Will I mean, you admit it, there were some good moments? No, there are. We're going to talk about them. Okay. But I mean, as, I didn't see anything here. And you know, I would assume that a lot of the people that were there were there both nights. It was that, that uh, obviously that would, that would be a, a thing, right? The most dedicated people got the two night tickets when they first went on sale or whatever, right? I would think, but I have no idea. But regardless of one night or two nights of this, I didn't see anything there. And I don't know that there's anything that is in the world that exists that would make me want to leave my home, spend money, travel someplace in the middle of a pandemic, sit in a fucking stadium full of people in the rain and for and my ass go to sleep for five hours by the time you get in there and sit down and by the time the thing's over with. And then two nights in a row, I don't know what the attraction would be that would get me to uh to do that. Anyway, you were you were doing an introduction of some description. Of some description. I think I had an ending of some description. I can think of a few descriptive words oh, without endings. It, it was basically left to me and I just wandered <laughs> off, right? Well, it was thrown in your direction, but WrestleMania... I managed to dodge it. You did. WrestleMania 37 in... Was it Tampa or Tampa Bay? I don't know what it was, but... Well, it's, it was, it's Tampa, but they, they had to get the... Because there was a ship there, because there were pirates. Except all the pirates, they were given the R or the accent like that. I thought the pirates all came from Somalia now. They don't sound like the no, old... they're the celebrating the classic pirate. The classic pirate. The pirate of yesteryear. The pirate of yesteryear was <laughs> was being honored by this two-night extravaganza in the middle of a goddamn global pandemic. Uh, but it, 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 night one started off, it was, it, it was appropriate there for Vince with all of the talent on the stage. As we all know, it's all phony now anyway, and they're about to pretend to be mad at each other. What the fuck? Uh, to welcome back the fans after a year and whatever, that... I can see that. We probably would have told Vince that's something you should do back in the day. That was the right place for it, and it was short and to the point. So, it, it could, I don't know now whether Vince is trying to put on his gravelly voice or whether that is his voice now. Because it's, it, it, you know, he's always he always has the public Vince voices like as... Bruce used to joke about not queen of soul, but no, he's just, that is his so voice now. these days. That is his voice now. Yeah. But it was shortened to the point. And then 
what was her name? BB double D it sang America, the beautiful. It was I'm from the twin peaks of the mountains to the valleys. Her valleys were certainly peaking. Uh, I don't know who the fuck she was. <laughs> I don't know. I can't help you. Is she someone? Well, she's someone who I don't know. <laughs> She is a bird in this world. She, all right. she appears to be a celebrity of some sort. It's like, remember when Randy Savage had all the managers trying to get him in WWF and he finally reveals that it won't be Bobby Heenan. It won't be Luscious Johnny. Yeah. It's going to be this woman. And Elizabeth walks out. They don't say who she is. And Bruno St. Martino's response is, who is that? Some sort of movie star? <laughs> yes, Bruno. It's some sort of movie star. <laughs> Ah, and then Bruno followed it up with, and she's standing next to a box-like structure. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, and now is the Stewie Griffin compliment. I, we're just going to be silly today, folks, because I haven't had a lot of sleep, and I've had a lot of shit on my mind, and watching this stuff just sent me over the edge. But um, we'll start with the Stewie Griffin compliment sandwich. The, the WrestleMania cold open. State of the art. As always, this is network television. This is NFL films kind of stuff. The graphics they do, the editing, the shots that they get to build these things, the voiceover, the 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 voiceover writing, the voiceover talents. This was tongue in cheek, but it was it wasn't done silly like amateur kids on a cable access show. It was fucking halfway entertaining and didn't make the business look any particularly more silly than they usually make it look. Um, this studio knows what they're doing. And then they revamped it for night two. Overnight, they had edited in highlights of night one in places that it made sense to do so. And so they didn't, even though they reused the body of the the cold open, they still altered it for the for the next night showing. But I mean, just the... The money they spend, the equipment they've got, and the people that they have that operate this shit. Uh, it, it not, have, having nothing to do with wrestling. I'm just, from, from my interest in and experience in the television business, I just marvel at some of the things they can put together if this was about, you know, fucking Roland Martin's fishing show. It's just such quality. What'd you think? How would I Rowan and Martin's fishing show? That might oh, be funny. No, Roland, Mar you remember I'm Roland thinking of a Martin's funny take of it. Show. Laughing on the water. I think it could be great. All right. Of course, they had to shoehorn the word entertainment in as much as they possibly could in this yes, thing. Anyway, we came into the rain delay and they were all, uh, you can tell the announcers assholes were puckering because they're like, ah, oh, shit, we don't know what to do. Um, and they let the guys have interviews. And since they had no time to prepare the interviews, nobody wrote anything. They didn't even know they were going to do this till moments before they went on the air, from what I understand. So <clears throat> they just, like in the old days, you know, when, when I would be, I usually stood at TBS. I don't know if I've told you this or not, but I would usually stand near the control room, but not in it at TBS at the, at the tapings, because I like to, there was a little outside anteroom there where the, the fucking a two, the audio guy, he didn't give a fuck whether you're standing there or not, but I didn't actually go in the control room unless dusty called me in. That's where dusty was behind the table and the director and, and all the important shit went on. But I always stood there for two reasons. One, because I liked three reasons. I liked to see how the television operated. I like to hear Dusty saying positive or negative things and what he said them about so I'd know or to what to do and not to do. And three, because every time the last segment ended early, he would look at JJ, who'd probably be standing over with him, get throw and throw a such and such or get somebody and go out there. And that's several times on the closing two minutes of the show, you'd get a fucking bonus interview. Even if he'd already been out there, he'd say, hey, Cornette, go kill two minutes. That's when I ended up in the podium with Ronnie Garvin choking me. That fucking clip we've talked about. That was one of those, we got two minutes. Go out and fucking do this. Right? So anyway, that's when you, you get some of your best stuff. But it was a mixed bag here because some of these people have never 
been put in a position to go out and actually say something on television that they weren't told to and drilled over and over again, right? So it separated the uh, the people who need material from the people who don't. And I was surprised because MVP was not one of the people that, that just tore the fucking house down. I expected a scorcher and I got a sunburn. He, it was like he spoke well with what he said, but he didn't really say anything. He didn't build anything. It was like he just was, a lot of them were just killing the time. Um, Bobby Lashley at one point looked confused. Like somebody was trying to tell him something off screen and he's looking at that face. And then he gets the mean face. I think they're probably telling him to get a mean face and it made him look even more confused. But, um, McIntyre came in, picked the energy up a little bit. Uh, we we uh, we saw a quick bit of when they got in between him and MVP and Lashley. We we saw Jamie Noble first time he's been on television in a while that I've seen. Um, and McIntyre, you could tell, was the same way. He wandered around verbally because he didn't really know how to build this up and pay it off at the end, but he because he was trying so hard, he worked himself up into a fucking decent emotional promo at the end of it. Is, I mean, is that any way to describe it? He kind of talked himself into it. I guess as he so. went along. It was all right. Um, but, but they, I mean, even the guys who have little or no idea what to say when nobody has told them what to say, sound more natural saying nothing like here, like, Kofi and Xavier, they didn't say anything, but they had a little oomph saying it. But then what I don't know, Big E or Titus O'Neil, which one I was going to bet on to have a stroke or a fucking hernia cutting a promo over this weekend. He came in and was over the top to the point where I was afraid he was going to have a fucking aneurysm. Um, and if you noticed that about, well, we'll talk about old Titus in a minute here on the first night, but Strowman came in and he's trying to make up and tell the, the bullied and, and cold, stupid backstory that they've told, but he had no idea how to build, deliver and pay off a promo that tells a story. So he would just blurt out some declarative statements and, and with a big exclamation point on the end of it. And then the girl interviewer would, well, we're we're not actually done yet. So she'd ask him another question. He'd do the same thing: staccato, boom, 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 and I'm gonna kill him. And uh, we're not. And then she'd have to say something else to him. So he just was. I get. He's probably never been in that position before. I would think. And then, guess who saves the day, and knocks it out of the park, and cuts a fucking wrestling promo, and tells a fucking story. Imagine this. It's, it was no surprise to me as soon as I saw his lovely chubby cheeks. Kevin Steen, Kevin Owens, and probably with five minutes notice of, hey, you're going to have to kill some time. He gets it because that's his major talent, talking promos that sound like he is really talking. Uh, you know, and uh, whether he goes crazy with the uh, the indie wrestling sometimes with the furniture and the fucking Home Depot supply truck or whatever. But that's his thing, that he can talk. And he... Would, would you say that's one of the better promos I've heard him do on their television because that's the only time it's actually been him talking? I thought it was really good. So, and but of course... You know, these are the guys with a wrestling background instead of the guys that have just, you know, been taken to the performance center and, you know. Anyway, uh, Bianca Belair went 100 miles an hour, didn't say much, but at the same time didn't stumble over what she was saying, and, and it wasn't bad. I was surprised. <laughs> Seth, okay, you might get this. Was Seth Rollins at one point when he came in trying to halfway channel handsome Jimmy Valiant? I don't know what he was doing. What was he doing? It was kind of bizarre. He was very jovial and... 
I didn't, didn't expect it. He was, is he not the Monday Night Messiah anymore? Is that gone? I hope it is. And I and I, well, didn't he switch? He switched nights. So now they're on, isn't he on SmackDown? Would he be the the Friday Night Fuckwit <laughs> instead so. of so maybe he had to get out of that completely? But no, but actually. I wrote, has he been promoing like this, or is this just what he wants to do and they won't let him? Because it gave him some... Remember we were saying his Monday Night Messiah promos are just drone on and just monoton monotonistic delivery, to coin a phrase. And in here, he's got personality. And he's... he's I, well, I was listening to him for once, instead of it, him sounding like somebody just woke up out of a fucking soma coma. Um. Miz and Morrison kind of did the same thing. I've always liked Morrison. I don't know what Johnny Drip Drip is, except I thought he got that cured. I told him the right doctor to go to here in Louisville. That was back in the OVW days. <laughs> Come on. Um, no, I'm, I'm. It's just <laughs> all these comments are for the purpose of comedic exaggeration. <laughs> Trademark. Um. <laughs> Okay, so after the 25-minute, did you have any final comments on the rain delay promos? No, it was one of those moments where you realize, wow, I've never, I'm a baseball fan. I'm used to lots of rain delays. The Mets just had one. But I've never had one during wrestling. It was the first one I've ever experienced from home watching on TV. I can't remember another one like this. You didn't know when it was going to end, so it was interesting to see what they were going to throw out there. And I think, although not perfect, that the segment really boosts the argument of everyone that thinks that there should be more promos that aren't completely scripted because it was more interesting. Yeah. Seth Rollins, that was the problem. He was coming out there reading someone else's words with the Monday Night Messiah thing beyond his screechy voice, which I don't know how much I could listen to that. <laughs> but the material was awful. At least here, he was showing some sort of personality i'm not sure what it you know he's like wild and crazy guys off uh snl i don't know what he was doing exactly but i like it better unscripted uh and as far as rain delays that's why traditionally until it became a thing for wrestlemania that had to be that uh, you didn't really want to do a big show outdoors um of course i mean probably the only city that i can think of in the country that had regular outdoor wrestling pro wrestling on a major league basis for years and years and years. And it was a habit was Knoxville. Um, and they were, you know, outdoors from May to what September, or October at, at Chilhowee park for since the fifties and people would sit in the rain cause it happened, you know, a lot. But in most cases, if it was your big fucking show, that's what happened with Bruno and Pedro at Shea Stadium in 72, right? It rained all day. And that was a did, cold rain, too. Uh, yeah, because it, it. it was the first week of September in New York. Yeah. <clears throat> so as a result, they didn't do but a couple thousand people more than they would have done at Madison Square Garden and soured Vince Sr. on, on that idea. But anyway, but we, we used to have weather delays uh, you know, on spot shows or, you know, places in the summertime where you'd be doing outdoor shows or whatever, you know, for just regular house shows, but nothing of this magnitude. And then a credit, the bash is in 86. Who was the fucking, I can never remember which country music star it was. It was in Jacksonville at the Gator Bowl, but they pulled the plug on him. And was it, was it Waylon Jennings? Was it, God damn it wasn't George Jones because it was in Cincinnati. They threw him in the shower because he was drunk to get him on stage. But who, whatever country music star was at playing at the 86 Jacksonville, Florida, uh, Great American Bash, the rain was coming and you could see the clouds and they had forecast. And back in those days, if you got the main event on, you didn't have to give money, the money back, right? So th what their plan was, was depending on what the, happened with the rain, they were going to get two preliminary matches on and then put the main event in and then see what the fuck happened. And I think they got more than that, but the country music guest was playing and, and was still playing and still playing, and they're really wanting to ring that fucking bell. And finally they went back and the phrase pulled the plug. They literally pulled the power to all of his shit. So he was still playing, but then all of a sudden you couldn't hear it. <laughs> And that was a way to get him off the stage. 
Uh, anyway, rain delays. Nevertheless, speaking of delays, we were delayed further from seeing anything interesting by the entrances of the WrestleMania guest hosts, Titus O'Neil and Hulk Hogan. Now, I don't know. I mean, you know, I've got bad hearing, Brian. And, and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm watching on the TV in the bedroom. It doesn't have the surround sound like in the TV room, but it didn't look or sound like Hulk Hogan got a hero's welcome in front of this particular crowd. I don't know. I thought he actually got a pretty good welcome night one. Maybe I, you know, wasn't paying the closest of attention to the pops. I, well, I mean, you know, seemed. I mean, they definitely showed a lot of people in the crowd with signs and Hulkamania t-shirts, which, but the older you get, the more ridiculous you look in one of those. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But anyway. I, 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 it, it sounded to me as I, night two, I noticed it more. But it sounded to me maybe on the, on the entrance, you know, it's Hulk Hogan. We're gonna cheer, but every time that Hogan would speak, you heard ooh, and every time. Titus O'Neil would speak before he would ever even make a point that anybody would cheer for. Just when his voice came out, there were cheers. And I think there maybe there was some jolly jokers in the audience. They were trying to just do the yay boo thing. Every time Hogan speaks, we're going to fucking boo in the opposite. But this is where I was surprised O'Neill didn't shit his pants. He was going so over the top trying to hype people up. And I know, was that because of the rain delay? They thought all oh, these people are going to be pissed or whatever. Um, hey, real, then, oh, yes. Sorry, I was going to say Waylon Jennings, 1986 okay. Jacksonville. Yeah, that's who it was. Thank you very much. And oh, Waylon, oh, Waylon was Waylon when they pulled the plug on his amplifier. Uh, but anyway, um, by the time that O'Neill pitched to the title match, I thought he was going to try to have a stroke. And then Hogan started uh, trying to go over the top because he was, and it looked like Hogan might pop something. And I just, I didn't know why they were just out there screaming. Like, I'm Robin Leach on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. I'm screaming and I don't know why. I don't, but anyway, I, I don't know why these people were needed to do whatever it is they did for these these shows. There is no purpose at all to the host of WrestleMania. You get really bad WWE comedy or names being yelled out for several minutes. It's pointless. Anyway, so they start the show on night one of WrestleMania with what allegedly should have been the main event because it was promoted as the main event because it was promoted as the one of the world champion uh, match for one of the world championships, and we get Drew McIntyre, Bobby Lashley straight off the bat. I um I like both these guys. As we've talked about, I think that Lashley looks better than he ever has. He's got he's kept his body, his conditioning, but he's gotten more experience, so his work is better. Um. You know, as a matter of fact, since he was an old OVW guy, I will throw in a bit of coaching if he happens to be listening. Probably not. But Bobby, when the guy's got the fucking headlock on you, step into your shoot off more and throw the guy off, especially guys big as Drew McIntyre. Um, But they had uh, uh, McIntyre. I've been a fan of, except I can't figure out why they keep giving him the title and then beating him for the title. When they were last year, they were supposed to, he was the guy that was going to conquer Brock Lesnar and be the new guy. And he's been beat. What half a dozen times since then. Anyway, uh, they had a good pace at the start and they were going for a big man match. I'm not crazy about anybody going to the floor so early, but that's a minor uh, offense uh, in, in these days. Um, I like the way that Bobby got heat on McIntyre and, and roughed him up. And then I like the way they did the, the, this hope spot. Remember when Lashley charged and McIntyre moved and Lashley went shoulder into the post and McIntyre went for the arm bar, but he couldn't quite get it and Lashley rolled through and got back on him. That was a well-done hope spot because somebody else, when Lashley hit the post, some other babyface or whoever produced this match, if it was some other producer, if McIntyre had turned around and pickled him, boom, 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 
hit him a time or two or d- gave him a bump or done something else and then gone for the arm bar, it would have broken up the heat because it would be making uh, at least a false comeback. But And the people would have said, okay, now Drew's back on offense, and if you stop him down again, well, but this way it was seamless. When Lashley hit the buckle, McIntyre goes for the arm bar out of the cell but can't get it before Lashley, still the fresher guy, gets back on top of him. It's a hope spot that McIntyre almost had him, ah, but oof, they took it away. And immediately Michael Cole says he gets him with the pound and ground. Did you hear that? Yeah, he's made that mistake many times in the past. He sucks. How can you make that Michael mistake Cole more sucks. than once? But how can you make that mistake more than once? Because he's not very good. <laughs> he's not there Nobody's because of his skills. Him. You think nobody's told him and made fun of it before if he's done it before? I'm sure they have. He can't get it. The pound and ground sounds like a fucking burger place that does kids parties. It, it, anyway, uh, so finally, um, McIntyre makes it. Well, not finally, but McIntyre makes a comeback. Then he bumped Lashley a couple of times, did the big nip up. The people were with him. There were... <sighs> There were a few awkward spots in here, but it wasn't flare and steamboat for fluidity, but it was physical. It was two guys keeping it interesting and being physical. Um, the camera cutting constantly was hurting my head and giving me an eye ache. It's I mean, so just bad. like I, it's the worst thing about I don't even know how you can ready four take four, ready six take six, ready eight take eight. How can you say those words as quickly as that camera is fucking? Anyway, um, there was the spot that Lashley blocked a superplex and hung McIntyre upside down, but McIntyre reached up and pitched Lashley off. And then a big choke slam, and Lashley milked it. McIntyre nipped up again. Uh, they had good action. They had a rotten one-two exchange. Uh, they are some of the many guys these days that can't get in the fucking gear to throw punches, especially on a one, two. Uh, but then McIntyre, big comeback, three DDTs, uh, and with the, in a row, like the three amigos with the last one being a one, two, just almost, that was a good false finish. Um, why would drew McIntyre, I couldn't figure out the dive. Because Drew McIntyre doesn't need to do a dive. God damn it. We just said this about Tommaso Ciampa. He didn't do a moonsault on Valter just because Valter's big enough to catch him because Tommaso Ciampa wouldn't do a fucking moonsault. Why would a guy six fucking five and 265 pounds dive out of the ring and, and re- at being used at the top level in the WWE and the money that goes with it, dive out of the ring and risk fucking hospitalizing himself, especially when he went right between MVP and Lashley, who just bent over and broke none of his fall. He just, in effect, took a giant phantom backdrop, McIntyre did, over the top rope, flat of his back to the floor. I could not figure that one out. And it did it look like anybody tried to catch him, or they just bent over and hoped for the best for themselves? I don't know. There's been a lot of dives lately that... I just saw one the other day from NXT where Shotzi Blackheart did a dive on... Two people it went right over them, right past them. They couldn't catch her. There was no way to catch her. Well, yeah, well, th- but this one was, he went right in between both of them. <laughs> right in between. Like, one looked left and one looked right. And it's like, well, there he is down there. Anyway. Uh, then Lashley going for the hurt lock, but McIntyre broke it. Gets the Kimura. Lashley makes the ropes. Nice rope break. At that point, I wrote, this is starting to need to go home. Um, And that's where they did. Little did I know I wouldn't want to see the finish, though. There was a bit of an awkward exchange where... And then MVP distracted McIntyre, but... Here's the thing. He just yelled. You're in a stadium of 25,000 people yelling. The manager at ringside is yelling constantly. I can see if he was starting for the Claymore and MVP had jumped up in a neutral corner of the ring to his eyesight, McIntyre's eyesight to the right to where he would take his eye off it while he was running. 
and then put his eye back too late. But why would you start, take a step into your finish and stop because the guy standing on the floor yelled at you? It could have been polished a little bit. Uh, but he missed the Claymore kick. And but when uh, uh, Lashley dropped down and then Lashley gets the hurt lock, McIntyre kicks off the buckle. Lashley won't let go. Uh, and then he just passed out the finish of the world title match. And I know a lot of people out there say, well, as, as old school as Cornette is, I'm old school, not boring school. The finish for a WrestleMania world championship match was a fucking full Nelson. And I understand that somebody has said and has sold, probably sold Vince on. Maybe it was Vince's idea. That a guy who looks like Lashley, the full Nelson danger. Yes, I get that. It's as old as time. And I understand, and there's a way to get the full Nelson over. But the, there's also, you've got to recognize, especially when you they knew that they were going to send the people home unhappy in the world title match the second night. I don't, you know, so they're sending them home not only unhappy, but bored. In this finish, a finish at, at a match this big needs some kind of bump or some kind of something or just something. And it, the full Nelson, if they'd have, if they'd have examined this thing since the, uh, the start, when they brought Lashley in, if they were going to establish him with the full Nelson, they had to know that, but that's going to make for boring finishes in some cases, whether they be fucks or whatever, because. The full Nelson is impressive when Lashley gets on Lashley gets it on somebody. He's shaking the guy, and the guy's fucking head and his arms are flailing, and some snots coming out of his nose and dribble out of his mouth, and his eyes are rolling back. That's imp and Lashley can have the mean faces. That's impressive, but it's also there's no movement, especially in a big arena. There's no movement in the ring. There's no bump to it. There's no motion. So. At some point, you're going to run into a situation where you don't want him just just clamp the fucking thing on a guy and just have him slowly wither until he passes out. If he'd come in starting using the full Nelson and doing that same thing to everybody that he gets wins over in his first initial run to establish it, the hurt lock, he gets it on and he fucking shakes him and they goddamn tap or they pass and he fucking drops him like a piece of shit, like a fucking German Shepherd drops a fucking play toy and then finally when he gets bigger matches then you get a baby face or two that are in the middle or upper middle that people care about and when he beats them with the fucking thing and throws them down he gets his hand up then he fucking clamps the goddamn thing back on him and starts fucking shaking him again and the first one gets a neck injury and he's out for however many weeks and boy, if you got somebody, there's always somebody that needs neck surgery these days. If you got somebody that needs neck surgery, even the better. Like the guy that could dislocate his own shoulder that used to fly in to do jobs for George Steele when he was using a chicken wing. Um, Then he does the same thing with another fucking halfway decent baby face, and he hurts him too. And then whoever the authority figure is bans the hurt lock from competition because he has injured two people. An MVP screams bloody murder and squeals like a pig under a gate about how his man's being discriminated against his best hold has been taken away from him and then the only time you see the hurt lock is after the match is over with when he's getting heat on somebody and then they can't stop him oh my god the match is over holy shit he's got the hurt lock he's injured people with that thing and he does it after or he does it behind the referee's back or he does it in an angle but he comes up with also something that he can give people a bump with and fucking pin them in a goddamn big match. You've still got your hurt lock, but it means more because now he's injured people with it, and it's so dangerous it's been banned from competition. So when he puts it on somebody, the people shit. Would that have been any better than just a motherfucker passing out at WrestleMania? Well, I figured he was using the full Nelson as a finisher leading into this match. I don't know. Well, yeah, no, he watch. has been, yes, but not at WrestleMania. 
They just fucking put goddamn Drew McIntyre out with a boring hold at WrestleMania. So what the fuck? And he wasn't. He if if somebody had given goddamn Drew McIntyre a pile driver before the hurt lock, then oh my god, he's bad neck and he's passed out. But he's fucking he's Drew McIntyre and he's he's been beaten for the title at least once since last year in a challenging position again, and then gets beat with a fucking full Nelson. The full Nelson didn't bother me, because look at Lashley. You know, he looks like he'll kill you. Well, yes. What bothered me more, like you said, was the MVP. I hate to even call it interference. It wasn't interference. It's Distraction. Just, Woohoo, Bird over here. I don't know what he did. <laughs> but all of a sudden, in the middle, he just turns what around of, and gets distracted. One of Riddle's stray birds was flying around. <laughs> I didn't like that. Overall. I thought it was pretty good, not perfect. I was surprised by the finish. I didn't think Lashley was going to come out of WrestleMania still the champion. I have to think most people probably didn't, and I feel bad for Shelton and Cedric, who didn't get a WrestleMania payday because Vince decided to kill that the week before WrestleMania. Uh, and both of the world championship matches ended with the heel going over at WrestleMania. What does that tell you about Vince's mindset? You being someone that's worked with him. Tells me he's changed it. Uh, but he was the, the king of sending the people home happy in the, at the big show. And even if they, even if every baby face just didn't go over flat, especially during the Hogan era, but usually he wanted, even if the heel had gone over, there was some hope afterwards, right? It was just, it was a, uh, but, but they don't care anymore because they don't have to. They're going to sell out the stadium for WrestleMania automatically. And now after people haven't been able to attend live shit, they're even going to be able to sell it out even more automatically. Next year in Texas, full of Republican lunatics and won't wear masks and they'll sell every seat. Um, But it, it, they don't have to sell pay-per-view anymore. So if if Vince wants to tell the story <laughs> that these heels are going to go over, then what the fuck? The the audience that they're going to get is kind of baked into the cake. They don't have to live. They don't have to sell pay-per-view. They're probably not going to do live events again for who knows how long. You know, it's interesting. As you're saying this, it hits me that the deal with Peacock is akin to a WCW wrestler getting a guaranteed contract. Yes. I could do whatever I want now. I'm getting paid no matter what. Well, yeah, I mean, that's been, that's pretty obvious. They don't have to sell pay-per-views. They ain't going to even try to sell tickets except to the pay-per-views, which will sell anyway, because there's so few of, you know, of events that people can actually now go to. Uh, they don't have to, they don't have to have ratings week to week. They have to have ratings over time. That will become a problem eventually with a network. They're on guarantees. And so they're, you know, they're going to start getting hangnails, not want to come to work or don't like the creative. So they suddenly remember an elective surgery that they need to have urgently. Just like WCW talent. They're on a guarantee now, baby. You know who's on a guarantee? I'll tell you who's on a guarantee. Yeah, who? The people that paint your life. They guarantee that if you don't love the fire, how'd you like that segue? If you don't love the final painting <laughs> that they you give you, your money will be refunded. That's right. We might as well bring this up now because I'm going to call paintyourlife.com and I'm going to have a portrait painted of WrestleMania the way it used to be when there was a big match in the ring that you had to sell tickets to because it's getting harder and harder to remember those days. But folks, if you want a truly meaningful gift, a professional hand-painted portrait, a quality gift for yourself, your children, your family, whatever, then you go to paintyourlife.com. They can take any picture, any photograph, or a combination of photographs and make professionally hand-painted portraits out of them that you can choose from a team of world-class artists and work with the details on them. And then within a few weeks, you get your hand-painted portrait, and it's guaranteed. So you can have generations of your family together. You can put yourself in a cherished place, a special place in your memory. Like for me, it might be hanging off the scaffold. 
Anyway, it makes a great gift, and you can get 20% off from the fine folks at paintyourlife.com, 20% off and free shipping if you text the word DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E, to 64000. That's DRIVE to 64 with three zeros. DRIVE to 64000. The folks at Paint Your Life will fix you up with this quality hand-painted portrait, and you can celebrate the moments that matter most. Terms apply. Available at paintyourlife.com slash terms. I was thinking about getting one of me and a bulldozer chasing Michael Cole. <laughs> what about a wood chipper? Well, I, I can't drive a wood chipper. I That's guess you can. True. Well, if it's, it's a big one, you can. But Well, if you get one of the big motorized ones, you can. And then, well, that way you could run him down with the front of it and then throw him in the back of it. See? One, two, three. In and out. All righty. Um, apparently, the Hall of Fame folks were there. They, they, they showed us backstage with Kevin Nash. X-Pac, Scott Hall, who now looks to be, what, 124 years old and having been floating in the river for the past three weeks? Completely snow-white, gray hair? Well, he's an older guy now. He's, he's fucking, he's, is he the same age as me? Maybe is he a year or two older than me? There are plenty of people your age that are full gray hair. I guess they don't have my youthful vim and vigor. <laughs> guess not. He looked like he was goddamn <laughs> just kind of standing around. But anyway, uh, and there was Hogan and there was Titus and there was Bailey. What's the deal with Bailey? She's uh, she's a social climber. She's trying to worm her way in as one of the hosts. Nobody will pay any attention to her. X-Pac was the only one that would too sweet her. Um, why are they trying to make Bailey look like a putz now? Zed, did I miss something? I have reason? no idea. No, I have no idea. I mean, she's one of the people that everyone always talks about how talented she is in the ring, and she is, and she's been over, and now she's like some evil Gilda Radner doing like bits backstage where she's delusional and she wants to be the host, and <sighs> this was bad. What was this? I don't know, and it was all weekend. All Every weekend. time you'd see her, she was, and she's like just making stuff up. And she was dressed like a 45-year-old fucking PTA president on the second night with some kind of pantsuit thing, and I don't know what's... Anyway. Either did the NWO, by the way. <laughs> they had no idea. They had no the idea. They were just like, let's get out of here. <laughs> um, and I should, I should mention also that right after this was the 18-girl tag team uh, fiasco. Turmoil. So, turmoil. Huh? Tag team turmoil. Tag team turmoil. Yeah. Well, I wasn't very, I would, I, I had termites. I had to go inspect for termites. I didn't see that. Did I miss anything? Not really. Good. It was an action packed clusterfuck. And the only thing I heard, I didn't see it because I didn't pay much attention, but funny enough, a noted wrestling historian got in touch with me. He goes, tell Jim to watch that match. I'm like, he's not watching that match. <laughs> there was a nip slip. But well, I didn't I didn't even see it and I had it on the background, so I don't know. I wouldn't watch that match if there was full penetration from a Tijuana donkey. How's that? What if it was actually just a man instead of some bestiality <laughs> thing? I mean, I don't want to watch the bestiality match either. Actually, I'm about to say, that. wait a minute. Now, what, what? <laughs> Whose nip was it? Mandy Rose. I don't care. I don't. Anyway, let's move on to Seth Rollins and Cesaro, or what was what was Seth calling him, C Ceranco or C Cerazzo, or it, embrace the vision has a lot more oomph than the Monday Night Messiah, also. Um, but anyway, I, we knew this was going to be a good match, and there, there, you know, there are a couple things out there. Maybe they even got uh, going a little too far, but um. Cesaro, he looks a little bit lighter, but he's in great shape. We know he can work. He's strong as a bull. The people love the swing. Thankfully, they finally, you know, gave him some limelight here, some spotlight here. I don't know why it's taken so long. Um, But, the, you know, these guys know each other, and also they're both athletic and they want to work. And, I mean, like, you know, Seth did the... He did the leap to the top that he does so well in the superplex, and then why he picks a guy up and gives him a falcon arrow after that great-looking superplex, I have no idea. 
but those are little things uh, in the you know in the uh, scheme of things um it's one of those things that if he was in ring of honor i'd say keep the first part don't do the second part because then you've just killed your first part uh but it, they had a nice match and cesaro's got a bad arm for a lot of it so he can't get the the swing he even tries to get it at one point only gets nine revolutions uh those uppercuts are nice that corkscrew splash that Rollins did, at least he landed it perfectly. I don't really know why that the corkscrew would land with more weight than the frog splash, um, since it's the same thing coming off the same fucking distance, but it was pretty and he didn't fuck it up, so I'll buy it. Uh, I noticed Cesaro has great facials when he's selling pain. They did a big, nice false finish when Rollins hit him with the pedigree, but then Cesaro countered the curb stomp into an uppercut and airplane spin with the and he does that thing with the airplane spin with no hands. I mean, you know, he's he's a freak. And and even though yes, he's spinning the guy but not holding on to him, you would you would think that's phony, but that's one of those things visually that he lets go long enough and then gets it back and he keeps the guy going and you can you can buy it even though it looks preposterous it it doesn't look it it is preposterous but it does not look preposterous you know what i'm saying i agree yeah you 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 get by with it visually and then the fucking 23 revolution big swing and hit his finish boom 1 2 3 and they even call the finish right give cesaro a win for once he deserves it look at the talent this guy's got and that's uh, we were watching those matches that Rollins was having when we briefly watched Raw. And I was like, what the fuck has happened to him? This was, you know, what I remember of Rollins more than, you know, I mean, a, a, a good match by both guys. And who knows whether they'll follow up on anything or do anything with Claudio from here. But I like this. This was worth something. It was all right. I really wasn't sure why they were feuding. They put up a video, but I just didn't pay too much attention. I had no well, idea. I, they were I, didn't, I didn't say it had the goddamn backstory of Funk and Briscoe behind it. Now I'm just talking about the match. It was okay, but to your earlier point about Rollins and our last time watching him, it is interesting that coming out of the Shield, he's the least interesting guy now, out of those three guys. Like there has to be something better to do with him. <laughs> I I I don't know why they uh, at least the, in the ring. The whole Monday Night Messiah thing was just Death. boring, oh, and they awful. they paired him with job guys, and it it was like just ineffective, feckless, as they say. I'm surprised you didn't like this match more than than what it you're was letting all right. on. Yeah, I don't. You know, it's just it's just all right with me, dog. It was it was all little right bit, in terms of dog. in terms of the in ring work it was all right but I don't know there was something not exciting about it it was think, just it was just a match despite there being two really talented in ring guys it was just a match maybe I'm just so excited to see something resembling a wrestling match on one of the wrestling programs there were there were no pieces of furniture there was no kendo sticks there was no outside interference in front of the referee there was no obvious blatant disregard of the rules they didn't spend five minutes on the fucking floor at the start of the match everything you see in every match ever now which is why i like these more when they actually have a match just my thought i get it uh ziggler and rude had a promo and they looked great, and they didn't say anything, but they had some energy doing it. And then we didn't see them again ever. <laughs> um, and then Big E was back to scream a lung up. Again. And, and Kofi and Woods were together again as the New Day, or together again for the very first time, or whatever, the, not together again. They have been a team, but they're together. But Big E was imploring them at the start to do well. And then it's New Day for one of the tag team titles against AJ Styles. And I've called him Amos in the past. The announcers couldn't figure out whether it was Omos or Omos. Uh, he doesn't have a last name, but God is he big. 
So I, I that was at the top of the, the notes. I said, okay, let's see if they got something here and if they know what to do with it. And apparently the answer to both, well, the answer to they got something here is yes. The answer, do they know what to do with it? They did the right thing here, but only after fucking up the entire rest of the match. Could you believe this? When did AJ Styles become the goddamn manager? <laughs> I don't know. When did AJ Styles, the former, one of the world champions, one of the world titles, he held that, did he not? Did I imagine that? Did I dream that? He did, and I just read something recently. I don't even know where it's from, but that AJ had, I think he wanted to work with Triple H this year. Triple H's like, no, nah, I, need, I need more time to be prepared to get ready. And then they stick him in here doing this. Well, that's it's. I'm sorry. But I know some people like the new day. I think all the colored trombones and the unicorn vomit and the screaming and the fucking the whole thing. I, I you know, eh. But they're still middle card baby faces. Nobody can deny that because that's how they're presented in this company and have been for quite some time. Kofi got a little run and they cut him off. And now AJ Styles is working against two middle card baby faces like I would work against the Rock and Roll Express. And they just and he's dying to tag his giant hoof. They didn't teach Omos how to fucking make it look like he really wants to tag. The guy's got arms 16 feet long and he's he's just standing there kind of halfway re he's short arming, as we used to call it. When you'd short arm your partner, it's like you you didn't really want to get in. He's doing fine. You're making a half-ass effort to fucking. I, I will. The only critique I have of Omos is when he steps over the top rope. I'm talking directly to you, Omos, if you're listening out there. When you step over the top rope, do it in the middle of the ring. Don't do it close to the turnbuckle. You're going to give yourself a fucking do-it-yourself circumcision, and you also look awkward because when you step over the those those ropes are stretched as tight as taut as real ropes can be and when you try to step over them right at the fucking turnbuckle there's almost no give and it it he looked a little awkward if you notice all the giants that look cool they go over the very middle have you ever noticed that brian i'd never thought about it before but i'm thinking about it in my head right now andre getting up on the apron and taking a couple steps and Doing it Over in the, the middle. Yeah. Right in the middle. Nash. It's only the fucking guys that are awkward. You don't know what the fuck they're going to do that they like the, the meme or the video that went out on Twitter of the guy trying to step over the top rope and ended up falling back outside the ring. That anyway. is the greatest video ever. He bounces yeah. up once in the and that's, goes and his, he was still, he was in the middle. He just couldn't goddamn get over it because he wasn't big enough. Oh, God damn. Anyway, so a former world champion and two middle card tag team guys just punking him out. They're then they taunted the giant. They had AJ helpless and grabbed his arm like you would the heel manager to give him the hope that you're going to let him tag out and then pull the arm away and taunted the giant. You remember what I told Bubba Rogers to do to the new breed when they slapped his hat off? If I get in the ring, kick yes. the shit out of them in, in a, a working, working way. way. <laughs> That's exactly what I remember. I was it, that would have killed the match right there because if I had been Vince McMahon and that was my giant out there that they've obviously they're building this and I explained why they shouldn't have done it this way in a second. But if that had been my giant and these guys with him, I would have got on the fucking referee's IFB and said, hey. Tell him to get in the ring, beat the shit out of them in a working way, stack them on top of one another. We're going home early. But anyway, that's the thing. is It, 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 it buried the giant who had no emotion because, let's face it, you, you could tell he's green. And he was intimidated being out there somewhat. And he's supposed to look like a badass. When Woods lets AJ get two feet from Omos, and Omos can't tag because it's not time yet, but he could easily just step in there and say, fuck it. Yeah, I'm protecting my guy. It just buried him having to look, you know, that's, uh, that's the same way baby faces used to uh, goddamn get hot when they would get buried in a fucking tag team match when a heel would let the baby face get too close and he still couldn't tag because it wasn't time. 
But the same thing in in this in this fucked up psychological situation they had going on here. Uh, it made everybody look like it. And then Michael Cole said, New Day, possibly the greatest tag team of all time with a straight face. I, so anyway, they beat AJ up and kicked the shit out of him for the entire match. And finally, AJ finally tags Omos. And did you notice the way that they set it up got a huge baby face pop? Shock and amazement. <laughs> Shock and surprise. You got an eight foot motherfucker over there that we haven't got a chance to see. You got the baby faces beating up a kind of a popular heel, AJ Styles, who's been a world champion and then taunting the guy. You can't get in the ring and help him. And then when AJ finally does get what amounted to a hot tag on the giant, the people popped. It made him a baby face. Why did they... <sighs> And that's what I was, I wrote this before he'd done anything. I said, why did they hide this guy? Does he suck? This is the most backward way of using a giant heel I've ever seen. And then suddenly he sells nothing. He throws them both around like rag dolls. He did basic shit, but he took his time and he didn't drop anybody or hurt anybody or fuck anything up. And then he gets in the right place for AJ to hit the phenomenal forearm off of his shoulders. He does a big power bomb and a foot on the chest, which AJ apparently felt he needed to remind him about. The match should, that should have been the match. If instead of the middle card baby faces beating up the main event heel to the point where they, the fans had sympathy for him to when he tagged out to the giant, they cheered instead of waiting making the people wait to see this giant uh, until the very end where they had built up this intrigue so the people were going to be positive toward him and popping for him no matter what the fuck. They should have started the match with AJ Styles scared to get in the ring of fucking with is the new day or whatever the fuck. Not scared, but like reluctant. Like, no, you start Om Omos and do this. He sells nothing. He beats them up and he beats them. Then people would have been talking. Then you would have had a new Andre the Giant, a new big show, a new badass. Then they don't, nobody cares about, apparently about doing jobs here anymore anyway, because everybody does them at, at the most awkward times. So you think New Day's... Was New Day going to argue, well, don't punk us out. We want to get a chance to punk AJ out first. Let us beat him up first, then the big guy can beat us up. What the fuck? Can you see this if instead of just dicking around with AJ, if AJ had come in and been a wise-ass heel and fucking say, you, you got to fight my bodyguard before I'll get in there, and then Omos just takes him apart single-handedly and beats him, boom, one, two, three. It would have made him, as it and it would have made him a heel. As it was, it made him a babyface, AJ a fucking idiot, and a New Day, well, they're the same thing they were before. Unicorn vomit. What do you think? I think that sounds better. I will say almost or Omos. I'm almost. Not, I'm not exactly almost, sure. Almost almost Omos. He has a hell of a look. His facial expressions. Just that one facial expression, just that... Yeah, <laughs> that stare. It's great though. He doesn't break. So we'll see what he could do long term. There's nothing really much else to add to this. I, I if they were gonna do this, I don't know why they felt they had to beat AJ Styles up for ten minutes first. Well, and without going any further, this is like very AEW. Now there's another guy in a roster with a giant backing him up after night two. Well, I, well, I, oh, God damn, I forgot about that because I just saw that moments ago yeah in in the in the middle of packing the 200 action figures and carrying everything over 10 pounds this weekend i've watched six hours of this shit so some things may fade anyway i mean you know i i hope that the guy is uh that they do the right things with him and that that he turns out well because as you said he's got a great fucking look but he did well here, but the the way where they got to how they got to him, I did not get at all. Hey, since Andre the Giant, I mean, we always heard for years ago when 
the WWF was after Paul White, the big show, or the giant at the time, even before yeah. when he was the giant, when you tried to get him in there, everyone always said, Vince knows how to do a giant. That's what Hogan, I think, told Paul White in WCW. You yeah. should go there. Vince will know what to do with you. Since Andre the Giant, has Vince done any giant right? There's been well, several guys, you know, that Big Show, great Kali, although he's obviously not on well, the Giant. Well, no, Big Show, Big Show ended up, I, maybe they would have chosen a different name if they could go back and do it all over again. But Big Show ended up doing all right. Um, I don't fault him for Giant Gonzalez or to a lesser extent Giant Silva because they were so limited to begin with. Um. Uh, so since Andre is, is an exaggeration, but in the last, in the last 10 years, that the 15 years, that gets a little more challenging because they've had some big guys. But when you think about it right along in a row, and, and of course with Andre, he was over already anyway, Vince senior, Andre got Andre over. Yeah. Really? What giant has Vince jr. Gotten over and done right. But, well, Hogan, technically, for those days, was somewhat of a giant. He came in, he was already Hulk Hogan. You marketed him differently. Well, was, no, he he was, he, he, the first time he wasn't Hulk Hogan until he no, came but in. when he came back from the Vince AWA. Senior gave him that. But anyway, um, I say Undertaker, I say Big Show, I say Mark Henry, if you, is your giant weight-wise or height-wise. I'll give you Undertaker. Mark had stops and starts, but that was because he was rushed in and... Uh, but you know, bigger guys, I don't know, know about Jack, but bigger guys, Vince had the affinity for, and he's gotten more bigger guys over than he's gotten smaller guys over. But I don't know. I don't know what size you need to be to get over these days there. Speaking of size, God damn, it's the giant that hadn't gotten over Braun Strowman was next against Shane McMahon. And it, I guess, does, is Braun Strowman even over to the definition that it is today? I mean, which is a lower bar than it used to be to say, well, so-and-so is over because they're a big fish in a smaller pond or whatever. Is he even over to the people? Do they give a fuck about him, Braun Strowman? For the fans that watch Monday Night Raw, yeah, I think so. Okay, for, well, they For the anymore. discriminating fan like myself, maybe not. Um, for all the reasons that we've mentioned a, a million times, and it was nice to see the King Jerry and the, uh, the red tuxedo jacket join the commentary desk. But for all the reasons, Shane is in fantastic shape. And I've mentioned he's my favorite McMahon. What a guy guts a mile wide, right? Balls of steel. He's 50 plus. He's the billionaire owner's son. This should not in any way be competitive. I've said since the start of it, I don't, I know Shane loves to do this shit and I know he loves to be one of the boys and I know he loves to give people the WrestleMania moments with the coast to coast drop kicks. He needs to be working like Bobby Heenan or me, or he doesn't need to be working because it doesn't matter if, if judo Gene LaBelle, they didn't make him the goddamn world champion because he looked like your fucking weird cousin that lived in a fucking apartment over the garage. Well, Shane's the billionaire owner's son and should not be competitive with six foot seven, 350 pound former strongmen competitors or any other professional athletes. Only in the world that they have created that is not the world that a lot of normal people live in should Shane McMahon be competitive physically with this guy or most of the professionals. Do you disagree with this? I agree with you, but I think unfortunately it's been done like this for so long that you can't go backwards. Shane has established himself as someone, despite never training to be a wrestler, at least in kayfabe, thinks he's as tough as every wrestler and is always willing to do whatever it takes to beat them. Well, and I mean, it's not like that's going to be the, the only case of that uh, in this episode of WrestleMania. But it was even... And I mean, Shane looks better than Bugs physically. Old Bugs Bunny. We'll get to him. But Shane at least looks like he can kick somebody's ass better than Bugs Bunny. But still, 
Um, and then it's a cage match, but Shane closes the door and won't let Strowman in until here comes Elias and Riker. I, Riker was, he had two tag team partners. One of them disappeared and the other one got heat on himself, wasn't it? So now he's just floating around. They were like bikers, disciples of apocalypse or forgotten sons. The forgotten sons. <laughs> yes. Well, two of them, two, we can't remember where two of them are. They're forgotten. They're forgotten. It's like they told my grandfather one time, they said, sir, to stay in better shape, you need to start walking two miles every day. After the first week, we didn't know where the fuck he was. But anyway, so they attack Strowman with chairs and beat him up and hurt his leg. And then the match starts. And Shane hits Strowman with like seven or eight chair shots. Strowman gets back up. Shane starts running. The body shots and the leg kicks. And Strowman actually selling them. And then... He's Shane tries to climb the cage and with, I guess with his bionic arm ripped a piece of sheet metal off the top of the cage and began pummeling wearing Braun Strowman out with the sheet metal. Uh, and then Strowman finally comes back and beats up Shane for a while. And then he goes to pick Shane up for a power slam and Shane drops behind on the power slam and goes back on offense. And I wrote, this should be ending already. And Shane hit the float over DDT that I believe Tom Pritchard taught him 18 years ago. It was ludicrous. Then he gets on the top rope and does the coast to coast drop kick. That looks like it would hurt him five times as much as it hurts the guy he's kicking. And it's ridiculous. The Braun Strowman, this is... And this is a case where I would have to think that only because it's Shane would Vince not be just completely lit by this. One of his giants, his strong man, the Chattanooga Choo Choo, is getting beat up by a 50-year-old part-time wrestler. But because it's Shane, that's not brought up. But it wouldn't end. How can any of the top guys be afraid of Braun Strowman again? And then, why is there a toolbox in a garbage can on the top of the cage? For any last-minute tune-ups? The they have fuck? To <laughs> it's like the fucking welders were up there and left their garbage can, and they'd put the toolbox in it so they wouldn't lose... To Shane climbs up the top of the cage, gets it gets in a metal garbage can, brings a toolbox out, and hits Braun Strowman in the fucking head. And that's why I've I started zoning out. Strowman it, Shane was going to climb over, but Strowman peeled the cage back and pulled Shane back in, and threw him off the top of the cage. And poor Shane, he tried to flip over. Because a, a choke slam is dangerous from a height like that. Because if you get going too far over backwards with your feet up ahead of you, you're going head first and you're backwards and you're fucked. So I can see he was trying to flip over and, and take a flat back bump, but he did one of those bumps when he landed instead of... If you hear two noises when you take a bump, that will be followed by incredible shooting pain moments later because you fucked yourself up. You should hear boom, not boom, boom. Fucking Sharknado will be editing the fuck out of this show now I'm doing all this shit. But anyway, <laughs> um, then he climbs down, picks him up, and power slams him. One, two, three. Thank God. I was afraid they were going to have to treat Shane like the fiend to beat him. <sighs> I don't know. I, I didn't see anything else that I need to bring to anybody's attention about that match. Did you? Not really. You kind of covered it all. But, you know, if there's one bit of advice beyond what you've just said to Shane that I could give, it would be after a match like that, you want to make sure you have a good night's sleep. You get a good night's sleep. That's exactly what I was thinking. And I'll tell you, if I was... Uh, if I was Marissa, Shane's lovely wife, or if I was a member of the McMahon family or somebody that loves Shane after... A performance like that, I would be right now ordering up a Helix sleep mattress. 
for Shane McMahon from the fine folks at helixsleep.com. That's H-E-L-I-X for those who can't understand my southern drawl. Um, that's what Stace is recuperating on right now. These Helix mattresses are incredible, and they're, they have multiple types. Um, as a matter of fact, Stace is the one that took the quiz for us, but she knows what I like. But what you do is if you go to helixsleep.com, they have a quiz that takes like two minutes to complete, and it asks you how you sleep and on what side and your preferences, and it selects then the perfect mattress that they have for you. It's tailored just to your specifications for the way that you like to sleep. Even They've even got a Helix Plus mattress for the more portly out there in our audience. They've got soft, medium, firm. They've got mattresses that cool you down if you sleep hot. Or if you, even if you get hot before you go to sleep. Ho oh, yeah, These things are great, whatever the case. Even if you've just had back surgery, as I mentioned, you can recuperate on one of these Helix mattresses. They are, in all seriousness, I was mad because we got the Helix mattress right after we had bought a brand new mattress for another bed at the at the regular old mattress store. And once I felt this Helix, I said, well, we just jacked ourselves and we spent twice as much as we should have, and it could have been delivered to our door. Not even talking about the the mesmerizing unboxing procedure. When they bring this mattress to you, folks, it's in a a box about the size of three bread baskets. And and you unwrap it according to the easy to follow instructions. And if you can't unwrap something even without instructions, you probably you're in a home somewhere, and this thing just springs to life, and it's fucking gorgeous. Anyway, go to helixsleep.com slash JCE. Take the two-minute sleep quiz. They will match you to a customized mattress that'll give you the best sleep of your life, and they've got a 10-year warranty. Plus, you get to try these things out for 100 nights risk-free. If you don't love it, they'll even pick it up for you. I think if I were y'all, I would be at least cognizant of and appreciative of this fine offer and don't do any anything that would cause stains on that mattress for that those hundred nights but anyway right now helix is offering up to two hundred dollars off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com if you go to helixsleep.com and put in the slash jce that's when you get the 200 bucks off, up to 200 bucks off, and two free pillows. Helixsleep.com slash JCE. And you'll love taking the quiz. Brian, you got 100 on that quiz. I did, I guess. Yes, I did. In fact, I'm going to be ordering another Helix Sleep mattress very soon because the one I intended to use in the office for my, it's the middle of the day, I'm going to take a nap mattress. Y- your day bed was taken by one of my daughters, so I need to get another one. That little Jezebel. Hey. Day bed. Oh, ho, ho. better than the night bed. Oh, ho. master of the pillows. Oh, ho, ho. oh, you didn't have a witty ending to that? I'm just making it up as I go along. The day bed. Now, and that's, we got to, we got to put somebody on that too. Einar. Who knows? You got to stop handing out musical assignments. Musical assignments. It's <laughs> well, hey, hey, I'm trying to get into wrestling. It's all about the music these days. I don't know who these fucking musical artists are. Well, Jim, speaking of transitions, certainly no one was sleeping on this year's Hall of Fame class <laughs> for the WWE Hall of Fame. It looked like the Hall of Fame class was asleep because I, I'm. It didn't look like the the most heart-wrenching Hall of Fame ceremony ever when they were having people give speeches in an empty room to a television audience and no presenters and limiting, I guess, from what I heard, I didn't see the unedited version yet. I don't know if I'll seek that out, but it was a little dry from, from previous years. But they had to get it done, I guess. A question I have, does Titus O'Neil wrestle anymore? I don't know. I can't think of the last time I saw him in the ring, so I don't know. Then do they just pay him to go around and be nice to people and do things for the community? He's a brand ambassador. So basically, 
that time that Vince was pissed at him for apparently nothing and fucking buried him for a while, they're still they're still paying for that. <laughs> I hadn't thought of it in that way, but I guess so. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's I'm sure he's a, a nice guy. I haven't met him. Don't have anything against him. But what does he work for the company for except to go and do good things and for the community to make the WWE to make the WWE wrestlers look like charitable, fine, upstanding people, but he doesn't wrestle? Wouldn't it wouldn't you want one of the guys that's actually wrestling on your shows to be going and doing all these nice things wasn't that the way eddie graham used to do it in florida i believe so i don't know but anyway he's it, he's out there with hogan and and at least hogan is a legendary name in wrestling but you understand why he's not wrestling because he's fucking 60 something <sighs> all right is it time for the 20 bouncing bunny rabbits a lot of people have been talking about this match with Bad Bunny teaming with Damian Priest against The Miz and John Morrison. Yes. Well, I fast forwarded when I saw the bouncing bunnies through all of the entrance caca and I saved apparently about 15 minutes. But what I saw was Bugs came in on an 18 wheeler. Is he a truck driver? No, he just happens what to was like the He likes trucks. He likes trucks. Well, I'm glad he didn't like goddamn yachts or they'd have had to fucking film him coming in from the bay. Anyway, uh, the match that everyone's been talking about, Damian Priest and Bugs Bunny against Miz and Morrison. And everybody, I, from what I understand, has just been shocked and amazed and just complimentary and blown away by how good Bugs Bunny was in his first match. Is, is that basically the the perception that everybody had of this? I wouldn't say everybody, but that is the way that a lot of people are taking in the match. I don't know if perception is the right word, but it is the way people are evaluating this match and this performance. That's what was wrong with it. He did everything. Explain to me why it makes any sense in the world to present a fucking 145-pound rapper in his first professional wrestling match that would go along with the first professional sport he's ever participated in, and he's as competitive with the wrestlers and or as able to do these fucking moves as they are. Explain to me why that that makes any sense at all or just makes wrestling look easy like any schlub that wants to go to a wrestling training center can do it. Which is what they all these schlubs going to these wrestling training centers already think. How does this, how is it? I even saw, and I like Mike Bennett, but I saw on Twitter, the couple minutes I got the chance to look at Twitter, he said, well, it, at least it's different when somebody takes the business you know, respectfully and responsibly and seriously and, and applies himself in a well, that may mean that Bugs Bunny's a nice guy, but that means that whoever let him do this shit just because he's a celebrity is a complete fucking idiot. A complete fucking idiot. Yes, you can have celebrities in matches, and you can work out shit for them to do, but it doesn't include having them do every goddamn move and more in some cases than the average professional wrestler does and do it all right. That's fucking ridiculous. And it, Bugs out wrestled Miz. But then Miz went to cut him off and went to shit can him out of the ring. And in the middle of it, Bugs forgot how to take a bump out of the ring and just rammed his face into the middle rope. Because he turned the wrong way. And he was like, oh shit, in midair. But it's, it was completely ridiculous. Miz and Morrison were having to wrestle themselves and take their own bumps around this guy. He started the match. He was in the whole way. Priest is not touching anybody. And I know that Priest was injured and they cleared him for this match. And I'm sure he was probably still suffering effects. But what the fuck? Bugs started out for the first however long, handling himself quite well against both Miz and Morrison. And I wrote, this should be on AEW because this is the closest thing that I've ever seen in the WWE to a make a wish match. So 
I got to a point where I had a fuck enough before Damian Priest ever got in the ring. I was sick and tired of waiting on it. I'm a big fan of his. I'd love to have seen him at WrestleMania. It wasn't worth watching them let this fucking anorexic rapper live out his WrestleMania wet dreams. And so I fast forwarded through apparently another eight minutes of this. What eventually happened? Bad Bunny and Damian Priest victorious at WrestleMania. Who beat who for what? With what? That's a fantastic question that I wish I remembered off the top of my head. However, I don't. I've seen plenty of d- b- highlights of Bugs Bunny diving off the top rope out on the floor and doing this and doing that. I didn't see a goddamn thing about Damian Priest. You know, he is a big celebrity. Suzanne is aware of him. The kids are aware of him. And Suzanne happened to be in the office when that match was on. And she looked at the TV and she said, is that Bad Bunny? I said, yeah. And she has no idea what we talk about here on the show. And she literally said, boy, they'll let anyone wrestle now, won't they? <laughs> she, I mean, that's what we always say people would say if they saw it. She literally said that. I know a lot of people going crazy about his performance, and I'm sure he took it seriously and wrestled like a wrestler the yes. way he would want to. There's a reason why Andy Kaufman didn't go back and forth with Jerry Lawler. Thank you. But there's a reason why Ronda Rousey was able to hang because she was a high-level athlete. Thank you. And you would think she was doing training. I think that's the problem here. He, You can't take anything away from his effort and what he tried to do, but it still shouldn't have happened. How do you ever look at the Miz and Morrison as anything other than clowns again? Miz was just a champion. He was just a world champion. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Of course, to be fair, he was portrayed like a fucking flunky when he was the world champion also, but that, and yes, you can have celebrities. It should be a reverse heel manager match. It's this guy's the baby face. So he's the celebrity. So Damien Priest starts and Damien Priest out wrestles the heels. And then Damien Priest sets up a couple of things that bugs can come in and do and, and fucking get his. Uh, get even with the heels and they get their comeuppance from Bugs because Damien Priest sets it up and then somehow the heels catch Bugs all by himself and fucking stop him and get a little steam on him. It's because the guy can sell and they just, they're, they toy with him and don't take him seriously as they wouldn't, which allows him at some point to escape and get the fucking tag and Damien Priest makes a comeback bing, 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 and then set something up, and then Bugs can fucking get the pin if he wants to because he's the celebrity after Damian Priest did the damage. But this was the second match that was just completely ass backwards. The... <sighs> All right, anyway, we've, we've spent enough time on Bugs. Um, I can't say the main event because it wasn't even advertised as the main event. That was McIntyre and Lashley. They did call it the main event on commentary. But they, well, I can't call it, but they called it the main event on commentary, even though it wasn't advertised as same. For one of the women's championships, Sasha Banks and Bianca Belair. And you said, don't you dare skip this, Jim. Everybody wants to know what you have to say. (sighs) Is this what it's come to? We've said sometimes you have a, a match and you, ha- you need a stadium, and other times you have a stadium need a match. Is it now that to prove that the women are equal, that they have to put this match on last? For it, it, Is this what it's come, that they have whittled the wrestling audience down so far to just the diehards and the people that are left that they don't see anything wrong? With the last match at WrestleMania is a girls' match. And I'm not faulting their effort. I don't... I, last year at WrestleMania, my favorite match was Charlotte and Rhea Ripley. I would have thought they were crazy if they put that on last as the main event, too. But like we said earlier in the program, it doesn't really matter anymore because they don't need to sell pay-per-views. They don't need to sell live event tickets. 
They're on a guarantee from the network and the cock. So now they can just make the, the girl wrestling fans happy. If this match had been on any, on, on any WrestleMania in any other spot, fine. It was a great girls match. They, they did well. A lot of gymnastics that I wasn't really fond of. I pre much prefer the workers. These two girls are better than any of the men in AEW. So it, it was certainly not a bad match. Or But Austin Rock, Andre Hogan, Taker, Michaels, Hogan, Warrior, Bel Air and Banks. Is this just what it is now that that the only people left watching wrestling don't mind that it that when two five foot three inch hundred and thirty pound girls are in the main event? Let me ask you a question, Brian. If the NBA and the WNBA decided to play their championship games in the same arena on the same night, which one would go on last? If it was the NBA and the WNBA would be the NBA, I don't know if that's a fair comparison to this. Why is it not? Because based on the reaction to the audience, Sasha Banks is as over as any of their guys I on know. the entire show. That's part of the problem. They have pussified pro wrestling down to where the, if, if 30 years ago people would have rioted if instead of blood and violence and people trying to kill each other, they got a fucking girls match for their main event. But now it's just, eh, it's another, but yeah. But it was yeah. great. I, I can't believe you're shitting on this in any way. It, I'm not shitting it was, on Was there a better match on WrestleMania night one? Was there a better match on WrestleMania than this match? I, I honestly, I liked um, Cesaro and fucking, uh, I, I like, as a matter of fact, Steen and, Steen and Zane will get to that, but I liked Cesaro and uh, Seth. Uh, but of course, there was no heat to it. There was hate to the girls. But I yeah, and it was a great moment. You know what? The Bianca Belair crying and being emotional about this. The moment of WWE. Remember last year when we watched NXT. You and I both said Rhea Ripley's a breakout star. She could be big. And I said, and you kind of agreed at the time. I see Bianca Belair too. And now they took both of these women, and on two different nights gave them the world titles in their various women's divisions. So it's a big moment. It was the best. I think it was the best match on WrestleMania. It, night well, one. and I, okay. I will say this Bel Air and banks was better than Ripley and Oscar. And we'll get to why that was yeah. here shortly. And that, and that spot at the end with her whipping her hair, I, I'm sure you'll get to it, but how did I, she make the hair whip sound like a bull whip? Man, Dutch man tell should be jealous right now of well, how that sounds. I don't sounded. even know what is 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 there a coating on that ponytail or braid or whatever? How would that even do that? I think if you take anything that long that's rope like or something and you snap it like that, it will I, give you some kind of sound. I do have some familiarity with different <laughs> textures of I'm sure whips and things that can be used, and I've I've personally never left a mark like that on anybody with a, a braided. Nevertheless, um, but I loved it. I actually know, thought this was when I said that I was left at the end of WrestleMania night one. Like, wow, you know what? They did things kind of OK for WWE tonight. It was because this match ended it. I came out of things with a very positive mindset. The only match involving females that I can think of that would have served as a WrestleMania main event was Angle and Rousey against Triple H and Stephanie. Because not only was that a brilliant pro wrestling match, almost flawlessly executed and wonderfully laid out, which makes sense because it was his wife involved in it, but also the, the story, the personal issue and the personalities, the people were batshit insane over it. And it was, it was over. And I don't even know if I would have made that, a main event, but that's, that's just me. I'm just remembering when lots of people watch this stuff rather than the very, very small audience pool that we are drawing from now. Both of them are great, but they're five foot three and 130 pounds and they're girls. And I'm going to be sexist about that because once again, I draw the comparison between the NBA and the WNBA. Th this match was definitely, it was good enough to be on WrestleMania or any other show. It was good enough to fucking, it was better than anything AEW could probably do with the men or women.
But on last at WrestleMania, I'm sorry, this is what it's come to. Not only have we pussified wrestling to the point where no, nobody's afraid of the guys, but there's as many females' matches as there is men's matches when that should be an attraction instead of a goddamn half-and-half half situation. Because as we've mentioned numerous times, there's barely any good male wrestlers these days, and there's a lot less good female wrestlers than there are male wrestlers. So when you're having half and half, you're by necessity diluting your talent pool down to people that are not necessarily the best at their profession because you're picking a, a gender rather than talent. And I think if you wanted to take a big look at wrestling in the last 20 years and try to evaluate whether or not so many women's wrestlers and divisions being pushed so heavily on TV and given so many segments, whether that's being detrimental to pro wrestling and to the fan base, maybe there's something there to study and look at. But when it comes to this show, Sasha Banks was as over as anyone on that show. And if the WNBA had a player who really took off in society, if like, you know, a crossover star, a Dr. J, a LeBron James, Michael Jordan, whoever it may be, Kareem. If the WNBA had a star like that, then you may see something where it's like, wow, this is a big WNBA game and people will really care. They don't have that. But Sasha Banks is super over with that audience. Now, whether there was a separate WWE women's show with just the women's talent, would it do good without them being on Raw and SmackDown? I don't know. But I think when it comes to this WrestleMania card, this was the best match in night one, and the fans were into it. The fans were into the finish. The fans were into the two wrestlers. They were really into Sasha. So I... I I, I, thought, chalk, I chalk that up to the fact that most of the guys suck. But, I, and again, <laughs> I, I don't disagree with you, and I think the guys' feuds typically are garbage, but... I don't care. It's just, I'm just tired of just phony, politically correct... What would have been a better finish? Men and women's... Of everything else on night one, what would have been a better finish to the show? A better match to end the night with, I should say. I say you put your world championship match on last, and if it can't follow everything else, you pick the wrong guy to be the champion and the wrong guy to challenge for it. See, Vince did give them the happy ending for night one. It just wasn't the men's heavyweight championship. It was the women's Raw? I think it was Raw. The women's Raw right, yeah, And there's another thing. When you've, when, you've got, <laughs> when you've got two world champions of each gender in one company, it's fucking ridiculous. And every match is for the title because everybody's got one. It's fucking stupid. It looks like Nick Goulas' Night of Champions, where he just, every once in a while, he'd book the Night of Champions and get some extra belts he had laying around and put titles on people to advertise them defending them. Anyway, closing thoughts on night one. Well, closing thoughts from you on that match. Uh, you know, we briefly mentioned the finish with her whipping her hair, but... The actual match wanna... itself. Did you have any problem with the match itself? No, I didn't have any problem. I said it was it was a good girls match. It was for the WWE, and it was better than anything that AEW does, men or women, most of the time. And these girls are athletes, and they're highly trained. There was a lot of cartwheeling and shit. I know they got the gymnastics background. I just can't get interested. Unless it's... Uh, uh, and to be honest, you know, I'm not trying to knock every girl wrestler I've ever known... Uh, there have been many good ones. I was a big fan of Mickey James's. I, I love uh, Miss Texas, Jackie Moore, Jazz. None I, of them I, ever got over like Sasha Banks has. Um, but that's when you would see a girls match on the card most of the time. Now it's just constant. And I'm just tired of it. I'm like, I'm tired of the three ways. Like I'm tired of the, I never thought I'd say those words. Like I'm tired of the... <laughs> Like, I'm tired of the goddamn garbage furniture matches and weapons matches and the no DQ matches and everything. And, and it just, eh. Well, I'll say for the record, this was my favorite match of the two nights of WrestleMania. I thought it was great. I thought it was a great way to end the night. I thought seeing actual genuine emotion from Bianca Belair was nice. Whenever you see anything genuine in WWE, it's a wonderful feeling. And I think it's cool. That two women that we saw in NXT a year ago, year and a half ago, are both now the two women's champions in WWE because those are the women you could probably build around for the future. 
And you know, the I, I, the girls and I guess probably now the guys, they are legitimately emotional and crying when they win these titles. It's nice to see, though. You can't criticize that. That's nice to see. Well, it, it works for I this. I just don't know how I, I... It's good to see. Uh, it's good television. But I don't know how that I feel about it actually being real. They're really crying over... <sighs> I used to get a charge whenever I knew we were getting the belts because fuck that means we're going to be in the main events. Do you think we're Dusty? On top. Do you think Dusty ever actually shed a tear when he got the world title? Oh, are you out of your mind? His his fucking accountant probably shed a couple of tears. Well, this is going to be complicated, but no, it it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't a crying thing. It was like, yeah, we're the top fucking guys, or I'm the top fucking guy, or this is going to be a hell of a run, or we're going to make some money, or boy, those goddamn, we're going to be on the main events on all this, God, whatever, not, oh, I'm, it's my boyhood dream, or my girlhood dream. That's the story you're supposed to tell, not what's actually, all right. Well, you know, I will say I really liked this match. I thought it was great. Best, not, best match of WrestleMania. Liked it so much, I may send an image of it to my skylight frame. <laughs> well, that way you would never forget it. There would be a picture, that not even a picture, but multiple pictures of the entire procedure and all of the combatants and the finish and, and all the pyro and everything, because the skylight frame, you don't just frame one picture, you can frame multiple pictures because it's all... Uh, not electronic, but how do they say it these days? It's it's all done digital. through the digital. That's what it is. That's the word that I was searching for to come out of my face. Uh, the skylight frames, you get these things and you can set up a photo uh, sl sideshow, si sh sideshow, slideshow, a photo sideshow or slideshow. So you can see multiple pictures. You can email pictures to these frames and they pop up right there, wherever you've sent it to a family member or a close friend. It looks like a real photo frame, but even the least tech-savvy people can use it. It sets up in under 60 seconds. Got a 10-inch touch screen, so you can swipe through all the pictures you've got stored with your finger. You can tap it and thank the person that sent your picture. Uh, you can get it for someone, and you can send them multiple pictures. I always thought that this would be good in the pandemic if you're wanting to send some candid photography to someone you love but anyway whatever the case however you want to use the skylight frame it is funny instead what? of text instead of sexting the photo you just send it right to the frame that there is you get, it's already framed that's pretty nice it's a good there idea there you go it, <laughs> and i'll tell you i'll tell you what dick pics have never looked so classy as when they're in a skylight frame Folks, and, and one Facebook <laughs> review said that this this gives her a little glimpse of us every day. So if you want to give somebody a little glimpse of you, get them a skylight frame, send that picture to them. It pops up there. You can start a whole thing. Anyway, right now, <laughs> you can... You can for the record, it's for the whole family. For the whole family to enjoy, depending on what kind of family you got. You can get $10 <laughs> off your purchase. <laughs> Of a skylight frame, that's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E, skylightframe.com. Enter the code DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E, and get $10 off your purchase. Skylightframe.com, enter code DRIVE for your loved ones, your family, your friends, your paramours, significant others, whatever the case. Send those pictures. Whether clothed or unclothed, whether <laughs> candid or posed, stop it. whatever they may be, you can send pictures of these things and the Skylight Frame people will, will love you. And you will love Skylight Frame. I have one yes, right they, outside yes. my office and I very, very much love it. And I've sent one to my dad. They're fantastic. Candid photography? No, I have pictures of me and the family and Swami and Keith oh. Hernandez and Daryl Strawberry and various what? other Mets. Of renown? You have pictures of renowned Mets on your skylight frame in your home? Well, you gotta mix it up. You come up the stairs, you don't know who you're gonna see. Will it be Suzanne? Will it be Swami? Will it be Dwight Gooden? You don't know. Oogie doogie. 
Keith Hernandez, Rusty Staub, so many great yeah. Mets throughout the years. Yeah, I, I remember Rusty Nail. Um, all right, should we go to night two? We must. Good Lord, we must, we must, we must improve our bust. Night two, Hogan and Titus were pirates. They were dressed halfway normally and having a conniption fit on night one. On night two, they come out dressed as pirates and they're talking halfway normally. They weren't screaming like maniacs. But the whole... Brian, do you know where a pirate keeps his buccaneers? Where's that? Under his bucking hat! <laughs> that's a... That's actually a Norman Frederick Charles III, the royal kangaroo. That's one of his jokes. <laughs> were you what? Guys, were you guys doing a lot of pirate humor in Chattanooga? Was, he just... He, he would he'd go to the fucking buffet. We went to the buffet, and he asked the waitress, he's like, are you allowed to take tips? She said, oh, yes, sir. He said, then take a tip over there and get me a glass of water, would you? <laughs> anyway. Great way to get um, spit in your water. Yeah, well, uh, hey, are you kidding us? Stuff that Norman Frederick Charles III used to do. He got that Schaefer beer. It was $1.99 a six pack back in those days. And uh, I don't, I think spit would have probably improved the flavor of much of his sustenance. Anyway, so uh, Hogan and Titus weren't screaming. They did some horrible rehearsed banter. And I swear to God, go back and watch on night two, especially every time Hogan would just open his mouth, they would boo. And every time Titus O'Neill would open his mouth, they would cheer regardless of what was being said. You act like I'm just delusional. I'm, not, I'm taking your word for it. I'm not acting like you're delusional about this. I wasn't paying. I must admit, you I probably, pay in any I should have paid more attention to Titus and Pirate Hogan doing their hosting duties, but I kind of lowered the volume when that was going on, and that was when I would say, what's for dinner? Yeah. Or can you bring me up some food or something? That's when I did my yelling. All right, well, Titus pitched to the first match of the show, which he said was going to be darker than the depths of Davy Jones's locker. Hey. Well, I guarantee someone gave him that line. And I guarantee you he should have given it back. Um... And it was Orton and the Fiend. And I'll say this about Randy Orton. He looks physically tremendous. They did a history package of this thing, which I didn't watch because I <laughs> knew we were going to get Firefly Fun Houses and fucking flamethrowers and et cetera. Uh, but the, I didn't want to see this to begin with, whether it was cinematic or a match, because it's already been just so repugnant this whole thing they burned this fucking guy alive in front of us but supposedly now he's come back so this is fake and they're not really mad at each other so why do i care and orton's in the ring and here comes the goofy music and here comes fucking alexa bliss ignorance is bliss and she skips to the ring to the stupid music and then walks up to a giant jack-in-the-box and turns the thing and the box pops open and out comes the fiend, disproving my theory once and for all. Everybody that comes out of a box is not over. And he stood there, and I, I wrote at the time, I'm giving this one more minute. And he stood there motionless for about 50 seconds and then dove off the box and jump-started fucking the match and did the thing where he wrenched Orton's neck. And Orton went down and sold it, and everything stood still. And they kept the red light on. And Orton was selling, and nothing was moving, and nothing was happening. And then Orton rolls out on the floor, so he, Fiend jumps out there, and they do a little fighting outside, and Fiend no-sells the suplex on the table, and Fiend no-sells the DDT. And that's when Michael Cole refers to the box-like structure at ringside. Another way of phrasing a box-like structure would be, a box! <laughs> And Orton hits another DDT. And then did you, after Orton hit, the first DDT hit on the Fiend, the Fiend popped right back up. Orton hits another DDT on him, and then while the Fiend is on his hands and he's getting up, Orton stomped his fingers. Now let me see just what we've watched. Fiend has been set on fire and burned alive. Fiend has had his head caved in with a goddamn sledgehammer. 
Fiend is, I think, didn't he get hit by a moving vehicle of some description? None of these things could stop him, so Orton goes to stomp his fingers. Maybe he'll tickle him next. <sighs> tickle me, Elmo. Uh, the Fiend didn't sell anything. Barely anything happened. The red light makes this impossible to watch without getting a headache. You can't see what's going on. I wrote, why am I watching this? Uh, flames shot from the ring posts. Suddenly. No, no, that's what... It, the Fiend is going for his finish. Sister Abigail on Orton after almost nothing has happened. There's been so little wrestling. I can't even remember the last time that this little happened in anything ever. And then he's ready to give Orton his finish. But he looks up. Flames shoot from the ring posts. And there's Alexa Bliss in the Fiend's jack-in-the-box. But she's sweating black shit. And it distracted the Fiend from doing his finish, so then Orton gave Fiend an RKO. One, two, three. He sold that. But why did his own girl distract him from giving Orton the finish? Did you understand any of this? No, I have no idea what happened, why it happened, or any of the background. And, and, I, watch or and I watched. And you watched it, and then Orton left, and then the lights went out. As Fiend and, was staring at Alexa Bliss, the lights went out, and when the lights came back on, they were all gone. Nobody was there. I wish they'd have turned the lights back on and all the fans had been gone, too. That would have showed them. So this was a complete waste of fucking time, and that's it for me for The Fiend or Alexa Bliss and probably Randy Orton forever. WrestleMania or... <laughs> And Randy Orton's one of the best fucking talents in the industry. But I don't want to see, and one of my boys, but I don't want to see him anymore because of the things they've done to him. And I will never watch anything involving this fucking fiend or this goddamn little twat Alexa Bliss again. Just, no. This is the stupidest shit I've ever seen in my life. A lot of people have been curious if you will take back your claim that anyone who comes out of a box gets over. I, as I just mentioned, it disproved my theory earlier. Cause the, but he didn't really come out of the box. He was coaxed. <laughs> no, fuck. <laughs> no, fuck all of this. Just all of this. Just everything that happened here. It was all rotten, and we don't ever want to think about it ever again. So night one ends with this amazing moment. Bianca Belair wins the world title. She's emotional. Her family are at ringside. You see her crying. It's like, wow, you know, wrestling can be powerful and, and good. And then night two opens up with this. Yeah. This, this was really bad. Embarrassingly bad. And they've painted themselves into a corner where now this fiend is not going to make any sense no matter what he does, because they've already, you can kill him, but not hurt him, but then you can give him an RKO and he'll stay down. But then he doesn't sell this. So none of Well, he lost his power. Apparently, I mean, if I'm just going to try to guess based on this garbage, the fiend lost some of his powers when the black ooze started coming out of Alexa's forehead. I, I, I don't know. Maybe old blade marks. I'm not sure. But once that happened, it appeared the Fiend lost his power, other than his power to disappear. And that's why Randy Orton was able to beat him with the uh, rather pedestrian RKO. All right, I'm going to watch Alexa Bliss the first time that black shit comes out of her minge. Let me know. Otherwise, she's on my banned list. Just like that word on YouTube. Yeah, none of this is making YouTube here. Yeah. I don't know. Whoa. All no. right. It wouldn't be black. Maybe it'd just be brown with green pus. Anyway. What? So we're, we're now uh, <laughs> Bailey butts in on Hulk Hogan, Titus O'Neil, and Eric Bischoff. With Hogan there, was, that was probably one of the deals. You, he's like, Bischoff is like Hogan's little dog pockets. He's one of the best friends. So if Hogan's around Bischoff, and, and he has to get his podcast plugged, somebody's got to do it. Um... But anyway, uh, Bailey, again, she's being treated like a nobody. She's a social climber. She's lost her 
fucking marbles. I don't know what's going on. Um, there was a girls tag team match with Nia Jax and Tamina both involved. And that was an excellent thing because I needed to make up some time to be able to meet our recording schedule. And apparently this took quite a while from, cause it took quite a while on speed search for me to get safely past it. And then another one of my favorite matches. Can you guess who? Do you remember the order? I could be wrong. Are you going to say Kevin Owens versus Sami Zayn? Yes. One of my favorite matches of the two nights. <laughs> that may be like being the nicest guy in prison, but still. Um, they gave us the package that used to be a history package where you would understand what it, what all has happened, but basically they spent the package letting us know that Sami Zayn has flipped out. He's nuts. There's a conspiracy theory against him. Everybody's in on it. Owens doesn't see it, and he's trying to, you know, tell Sammy, hey, maybe it's just you, pal. Um, Logan Paul was in there for some reason, basically because he's a celebrity and they wanted him to be, uh, but it didn't make any sense and nobody cares about him. Um, now that I've seen Logan Paul and they've told me about him, I still don't know what he does or why he's famous, but he was there. But the thing is, is Sami Zayn, at least he he was doing this. If you're going to have somebody lose their mind, at least have them lose their mind where people can believably say this guy's fucking nuts. He's doing a good... Imagine, too bad that he didn't get a gimmick where he was a mute, fake luchador that didn't speak and you couldn't see his face with all of his <laughs> facials. That really would have got him over. But he's a great promo. He's a weaselly little heel. He's got great facials and he can work his ass off. He's just like his cohort here, one of the bigger pains in the ass that you will ever deal with in your locker room. When you had them against each other in Ring of Honor when you were there, did you ever at any point think, you know, one day these two will be wrestling at WrestleMania with and Logan like Paul? It. With Logan Paul there. Well, I wouldn't have thought that because I've never <laughs> heard Logan Paul's name go fucking six months ago or whatever. But And I would like it. No, I never would have thought. Because here's the thing. And we'll go through this. But they didn't do the shit they were doing in Ring of Honor. They had a match and they worked. There was no ladders and tables. And the Home Depot supply truck didn't stop in so they could build their shop class projects. And, and thumbtacks and the barbed wire fucking whatever. They had a match because they had two here, and it and it it worked anyway. Besides the fact, I don't know why does Sami Zayn dress like Fidel Castro. That I have not. I've He's never a revolutionary. Seen. Okay, all right. Um. Anyway, as far as this match, both guys can work. Never said that he couldn't. As a matter of fact, a few years ago we were talking about Generico, Sami's former previous life i said the guy especially as a baby face he sold like ricky morton his body language the way that he can droop and feel like it just all the the strength has left his body and also he's strong to be a fishy white ginger pale muslim from french canada um he's he's strong for his size he's a hell of a worker it works as a heel also he was great as a baby face but his exaggerated selling body language he and he gets the idea of how to be an annoying heel he's had the annoying part down for years um they had to do the stupid apron spot where they do the brain buster on the apron just because they have to take stupid chances but this was a good grudge match the shit looked good it made sense like i said they didn't have to bring the furniture into it they paced it for most of the big bumps in the latter part of the match. They sold them. And finally, Owens hit two super kicks and a fucking stunner. Boom, one, two, three. And it was a good match. And people were into it. And Owens had some oomph to get them into him as a baby face. And then um, I started actually to skip the... Logan Paul afterbirth, but what the fuck? I've gone this far, so I'll watch it. And and apparently Logan Paul, because all the people hated, they were booing him anytime they saw him, right? Because I guess he's a fucking asshole in real life or the way he portrays himself. 
He's not very. I believe he's, so. He's not like a goddamn. He's not like Titus O'Neil. He's going out and doing good things for the community. I also don't think he's really the same fan base as the majority of the WrestleMania attendees. Well, whatever the case, they're booing him anyway. So he shoves Sammy down, and Sammy leaves, and then fucking Steen raises, or he raised Steen's arm, and then Steen gave him the stunner. So I got him a big pop, but. Um, I liked it. I liked the match because once again, it's, it's so refreshing and so pleasurable to see two guys, two or four, but a regular match between two entities with no furniture and no, no DQ and them attempting to actually, you know, do what you're supposed to do with this instead of the shit that we see constantly. What'd you think? I thought it was good. I've seen these guys wrestle a lot throughout the years, but it was good. They always do a good job kicking each other's asses. Well, they're, they're best friends, and best friends always like to, to work with each other, and they always do each other's shit, so there's no you know issues with... That's the one thing you never had a problem with. You didn't have an issue with them against each other. They just had an issue with everybody else, or everything else. Um... The next uh, backstage interview coming up was Matt Riddle and the great Kali. And Riddle started to drool over him. And I fast forwarded because I don't want to hear that. If this guy, I, did he blow his line again? Or did he remember what he's supposed to say this time? I had this on mute. I didn't pay attention. Okay. Well, that's what I'm going to have from now on on all of, because I listened to a bit of this. And besides the fact, I think the guy's a complete fucking idiot, not only because birds fly out of his ass, but also because he actually busted a take on camera on a live shoot. And that's another one of those things that I do not forgive. So I'm off a riddle anyway. And now, but uh, he's, eh. then the match is Seamus against Riddle. And this time, Pirate Birds. Pirate birds, birds with pirate hats and eye patches flew out of his ass on his introduction. And I flew to the next segment. I didn't think anybody was going to be upset if I didn't include this in our review. Am I wrong? Have I offended anyone? I'm sure there's a fan out there who would like to hear your review, but I don't think anyone would be offended or really miss your review of this match all right and fuck matt riddle and his fucking live tv blowing goddamn birds flying out of his ass fucking flip-flop motherfucker all right nothing against Uh, flip-flops though they're wonderful except i will say that sheamus won because i did watch this finish back when i got to the end of it on speed search he kicked Riddle right in the fucking, just football kicked him right in the mouth as Riddle was back flipping off the rope. Just football kicked him in the mouth and busted him wide open. So that'll teach him, forget your fucking lines. Maybe <laughs> Vince told Seamus to do that. Uh, and this is going downhill quick. Then we, then we got to the Nigerian drum match between Big E and Apollo Crews. And, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, they had somebody else sing something else at the start of this program. I have never heard of any of these musical acts. This one I had heard of, Whale. Court Bauer used to do something with him every year. He's a big wrestling fan. I've never heard any of his music. Now I know why. What happened to rock and roll? And where are all the people that listen to it? And why is there nobody perpetrating it on this program? Well, there's no rock and roll being pushed by any of the record labels into the charts, so the charts is made up by a different caliber of performers, a lot of hip-hop, a lot of pop, very little rock, and even if there was a big rock star now, you wouldn't know who they are anyway. Well, at least I'd listen to them. There's various styles of music. You gotta be this open was, to different This things. was the most unlistenable music performances at WrestleMania that I've ever heard. And not even getting into what poor Rhea Ripley. No, Oops. that I think that may be the winner. <laughs> Quite frankly, Rhea Ripley's entrance. God, do mighty. Well, let's it, not. Uh, let's, well, let's, we won't let's, jump yeah. ahead because we're still in the Nigerian drum match with Whale. Isn't and it Wale? Is that how it's pronounced? I don't care. He wrapped old Big E to the ring. We found out what the Nigerian drum match was, is. 
They get in the ring. They look at each other. The match starts, and both of them immediately roll out to the floor and get kendo sticks and come back in, and the first moves of this match were the two guys wailing on each other with kendo sticks. Then they went out to the floor and continued wailing on each other with kendo sticks, talking about whale. And there were drums and cymbals and gongs around the ring. And there's two guys that have not touched each other hand to hand in a wrestling match before they just went out and got kendo sticks and began wailing on each other with them. And I wrote, life is too fucking short. I started speed searching. They used the stairs. They used the tables. They used the chairs. Oh, my. And finally, Apollo Crews sp splashed himself off the top rope through a table when Big E moved. And Big E hit his finish and was covering the guy when the world's largest college marching band leader hit the fucking ring. I, he must be the tuba player. He'd be the only one big enough to fucking carry it around. And beat up Big E in front of the referee with him standing there watching it. The announcer said, no DQ. You know what that means, Brian? Lazy booking. And then Cruz just covered him and the referee counted it. A garbage match with a garbage finish. And it was in Florida, so it was hot garbage. Can they not do anything except this bullshit? The weapons, the no DQ, heels get no heat because everything's done in front of the referee. It just makes the company look bad and turns the fans off. That anything means anything. That there are any rules or parameters. And that's, that's why we are literally down to the smallest audience that has ever watched professional wrestling since its inception ever and they just watch it as a hoot to do a, a fucking live action stunt show and the people who once enjoyed watching it have been so offended by just this type of thing that they don't care anymore so that's what that was what did I miss during the speed search? Did somebody get run over with a goddamn golf cart? Oh, no. I forgot. That's on the other channel. That was a. Uh, oh, it was on this channel too a few months ago. Oh, I forgot. That's right. They had to take a better bump off of it. Did you notice who the big guy was? Well, yeah, they were acting like they'd never seen him before. How many times you see a motherfucker that looks like that? There was a guy on Raw, Baba Dabo Kato, Daba Baba Daba Baba. Double bubble, Baba Kato, Daba Kato. He was on Raw. Shane McMahon said his name over and over again to the point where I thought it was one of the funniest names ever, Dabo Kato. And now they have no idea who he is. He was just all over their TV. And now they're like, oh, this big man, whoever he is. Dressed as if he just left a marching band. Possibly he's Sergeant Pepper's illegitimate son. I don't know. Dr. Pepper. So now Apollo Crews has Dabo Kato as his giant, and AJ Styles has Omos, or Omos. We haven't really... I know it's not Omax, but we haven't really honed in on what it is. And they're not even on the show today, so no. they just got a free plug. They're not. But you know, Jim, I, I will say this. You are doing God's work here. There are so many fans that we hear from, so many listeners of the two podcasts every week and all the YouTube videos that say... This has been a rough year for me. There's a lot going on. Thank you so much for being there for us. And some people need more than just listening to you rip apart professional wrestling. Some people need someone to talk to. Some people have real problems. That's right. In instead, of, instead of the self-inflicted problems that the wrestling companies have or the problems that we have, which are also self-inflicted and that we... We do this to ourselves for the good of the, of the people. For the good of the people, we watch sometimes so you don't have to. But if you need to talk about something serious, the last people you'd want to talk to is me and Brian Last, jolly jokers like ourselves that just take the piss out of everything. If you want to have a serious conversation, you can talk to the folks at BetterHelp. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist 
You can start communicating in under 48 hours. Whatever your problem, is there something interfering with your happiness, preventing you from achieving a goal? You need somebody to talk things over with. It's not a crisis line. It's professional counseling done securely online with a broad range of expertise and the services available worldwide. And once you make an account, you can log in anytime, send messages, get responses, schedule weekly video or phone sessions, whatever the case. It's more affordable than traditional counseling offline, as they say, actually in-person shit. And who wants to do anything in person these days? But folks, if you go to BetterHelp, that's H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash J-C-E, you can get 10% off your first month's services. You can join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional, betterhelp.com slash J-C-E, 10% off your first month. Of course, this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and that's why all of our drive through listeners get 10% off their first month because we like them and they like us. That's right. You know who else I like? No. I like me some Maria Ripley. Uh, besides her, is that the entrance music she usually uses? And I just don't listen to it, but it was louder and more noticeable this time because someone was screaming it in person. I think so. But whenever we've seen her come out, I remember hearing the word brutality to start. I don't remember it being just screamed nonstop throughout the song. <laughs> brutality! It was really, really bad. It sounded like somebody was disemboweling a drunken house cat with a fishing knife. In the garage, where it echoes. In the garage? In the garage, where it echoes. Where it echoes. Um, anyway, this is, this, that's why I said this is not the WrestleMania for, for music lovers, folks. Um, but it was Rhea Ripley against Oscar for the Oscar? Raw Women's Championship. Oscar, Oscar, you say, ah, uh, I say, er, for the Raw Women's Championship. And Lola called it a pillar. That's right. <laughs> she would have called her Oscar, too. Well, there's Oscar. Uh, here's the thing. Obviously, everybody knows. I think Rhea Ripley is a movie star. Rhea Ripley's an action movie star. Rhea Ripley should be the top woman in the company. She should have other women fed to her and maintain an undefeated record while they make the most money out of her that they possibly can, which would be millions, with and get her involved in some fucking major motion pictures and sitcoms, baby, because she's got the look. Uh, but this, and I was afraid it was going to be, is a clash of styles. I I know Asuka can do, she's a veteran and experienced and she can do moves and etc but I, but I I have not made any bones about the fact I hate the gimmick the screaming and the goofy faces and the face paint and the you know Vito Scotty fucking Gilligan's Island Japanese soldier impression and the you know the, that whole thing I hate I hate it but these are two type of performers Rhea Ripley is a worker. Asuka is a high spot worker. She wrestles just like all the other Japanese girls, a hundred miles an hour doing everything she can do. Even if it's done well, she does high spots and she goes from one gymnastics routine to the other. Rhea Ripley is a worker. As a matter of fact, I'm going to, after I've watched her again, I'm going to say as a worker, She's probably one of the best girls in the business right now. She, and when I say work, I'm not talking about the way she performs moves. She's a worker. She takes her time. She has different gears. She slows it down sometimes and gets personality in. Then she picks up the intensity. She's got facials. She fucking heals. She actually heals and gets down, slaps the fucking girl in the back of the head and is condescending. She has a look on her face is disdainful. She does trash talking. She has attitude. And she works with her body language, the way she, she sells shit, and then the way that she, she works like a guy, which used to be, it probably isn't anymore. As a matter of fact, they'd probably get mad now if you said this. But the biggest compliment 
that any of the guys ever gave any of the girls in this business was to say she works like a guy. And that is a compliment because most of the girls, they're built differently and they work like girls. Their striking is especially suspect. It's hard for them to make their bumps and things crisp. Athletes who have been athletes in other sports or who have grown up around wrestling get it. But a lot of the girls, especially the girls that Laurenitis was hiring, or these five foot two, 125 pound blonde pixies like Alexa Bliss, they can't get it. Either they don't have enough weight to even make noise when they take a bump, or they just can't move as sharply as, as you know, guys can. But Rhea Ripley works like a man, both mentally and physically. That's a huge compliment. Um, she it just got the pra- at, at one point that spot they did where Ripley stood up and German suplexed her out of an ankle lock. I loved that. Um, but that's the thing is it was a style clash because Oscar's trying to do all the shit that the hundred mile an hour spot girls do, and Rhea Ripley's trying to work, and it wasn't it wasn't a seamless pairing. So I've seen better Rhea Ripley matches, but uh. <sighs> I mean, Oscar made the comeback. Some sloppy kicks, a couple of reckless backhands. And then the the one what the fuck moment that almost ruined this for me was Oscar gives Ripley a DDT to the floor off the apron. Yeah. And A, nobody's Rhea Ripley's face didn't get busted open. Asuka took just as big of a bump as Ripley did. She's back in the ring by the count of five. Rhea Ripley beats the count. They did it well. You mean to tell me that that couldn't have been some kind of fucking TV angle to lead to a match where the girl takes the fucking DDT on the floor off the apron and doesn't get back up? That's the kind of thing, if I would see somebody doing that or working that out early in the day and I would ask them, what are you, what are you doing here? And they would tell me and I would say, no, <laughs> don't, if I was producer, I'd say, no, don't do it in your fucking match because you're not winning. She's going to win. You give it to her and then she comes back and beats you. The whole thing's garbage. Do it for an angle on TV and then she can fucking sell it and then want to come back and get even. Whatever the fuck. Anyway, um, Ripley got the standing cloverleaf, which is another, I love that fucking move. Asuka broke it into the arm bar. I wouldn't have had somebody break that cloverleaf on big time television this early for Ripley. It slowed down a little bit and got sloppy at that point. Hopefully we're going to see Ripley against different people in the future because this did not work to her advantage completely. But finally she ducked a kick, got the pump handle slam and one, two, three. So now here's a, a pump handle slam beats Asuka. But getting DDT'd onto a fucking floor face first from four feet in the air, they both just popped right back up, the giver and the taker, and got back in the ring. Anyway, this was the right result. It was the wrong opponent for Ripley to really shine. I'm loving to see a Ripley-Charlotte rematch in the future with people because that could be even better than last year. But uh, again, you know, just standing Ripley next to Asuka, she looks like a a fucking golden god, to to paraphrase Robert Plant, and Asuka looks like some goof in a local parade. I'm sorry. That's just it. I liked it. It wasn't anywhere near as good as I had hoped it would be, Mm -hmm. but it served its purpose. The elevation of Rhea Ripley... Do you think that it was not as good as you thought it might be for reasons other than the ones I delineated? Or now that I've said that, do you kind of have to go, yeah, you're right? I think the layout sucked. It just, it was laid out poorly. Plus it was coming after we saw what I thought was a fantastic women's match in night one. (laughs) And it couldn't live up to that. I mean, that match was so much better than this. But again, we come out of this, the big result. Rhea Ripley, now the Raw champion. Here's another thing. Bianca Belair on SmackDown, two NXT women being elevated, and they probably should be. They should here's be, not even thing. probably. They should be. Yeah, here's another thing. Here's another thing. They, I would rather see Ripley against either Belair or 
or Bianca. I started to say B B B B B Bianca Sasha. Miller or Banks. Sasha Banks. A lot of, a lot of Bs, but uh, I would rather see her against either one of those two than uh, Asuka because it's a style clash. And I bet you the other girls do a better job working with her. You may anyway. be right. Yeah, you may be right. All righty then. Titus and Hogan were back to do some more memorized banter. And this time, whereas the previous night, I, they must have talked to him about Titus. Try not to fucking shit your pants. She screamed so loud because now he had the emotion of a coma patient. And Bailey interrupted this one because they forgot to thank her. And she called for her pyro. That's why where I noted that she was dressing like a 45-year-old PTA president. And then out come the Bellas to cut a promo on Bailey. So they've been burying her just with her actions all weekend and have the things they're having her say and do. And now the Bellas come out retired recently in the hall of fame and beat Bailey up and throw her down the ramp. <laughs> and I got to admit, I have never once seen one of the Bellas wrestle to my knowledge. I can never remember seeing oh, a you Bella must match. Have. You must have. Well, when would it have been? I don't know. There had to be something we reviewed with them. I can't think of an example. Okay. They well, all I'm saying is I can't remember ever seeing them, but if this was a brief example of their work, I feel happy about not remembering ever seeing them fucking wrestle. Were they worth a shit? No, no, they were not. God, there are a lot of women's the, wrestlers. You know, you the can one see girl that the, whichever twin blocked Bailey's punch and the stagey fucking punch. And Oh my God. That's the thing, like Asuka and Rhea Ripley, those are two women that wanted to be in the wrestling business, and you may not like Asuka, and this may not be the best way to use her, but she's very talented in the ring, Rhea Ripley's great in the ring. The Bellas were, what, bikini models that were plucked <laughs> into WWE, so no, they were never very good. Uh, they're good as personalities, I guess, but not good in the ring. <sighs> All right. And what does that say about Bailey? She was just like their top woman there for a well, while. Yeah, that's what I was saying. She had, a, she, had a, she had two belts about six months ago. We were watching one of those programs. She did take a great bump down the ramp. Well, yeah. I mean, she's trying. I like it. She's got personality. She can talk and she can work. And But I don't know why they're acting. Suddenly she's a fucking flunky that's lost her mind. Anyway, we got one more to go. Mm. First of all, the package that they did at the start of the match illustrated what they somehow fucked up here. Can you mean to tell me that it this three-way where they shoehorned poor Daniel Bryan in to the match for one of the world titles, that this match was more attractive as a three-way after Edge comes back and suddenly fucking just turns heel for very little provocation and bashes Daniel Bryan's brains in with a chair and flips out. This match was better this way, or if they had just said, here is Edge who had to retire 10 years ago from a, a, a medical necessity and dreamed about coming back for 10 years and now has, has done it against all odds and is coming back for this goddamn Roman Reigns to get the title that Edge believed he always wanted. There's your story. Why did they change it in midstream? The people would have fucking, and especially if you're not going to change the belt. They just, they made Edge look like a complete fucking idiot. Bring him back as a conquering hero that's, that's conquered his medical problems and worked his way back in condition to get back in the ring for one more chance at the world title. A Cinderella story out of nowhere. People would love it. Respected veteran. Had to, everybody knows the retirement was legitimate. Bring him back and put him in a program with Roman Reigns and take it to WrestleMania and Edge gives it everything he's got but that fucking Reigns because they're going to put him over anyway still manages to beat him possibly with goddamn some type of chicanery from Paul Heyman. If you're not going to send him home happy at least there you've told a story and you've made it pay off. But they bring Edge back. He gets hurt. 
It has to go back again, which even would have fucking improved the story even yet. Comes back after that, and before he gets to WrestleMania and the big chance, he flips out because Daniel Bryan wants to be involved because the bookers put him in it, and he fucking turns heel on Daniel Bryan and becomes a fucking lunatic. And now we have a three-way with one real heel, one real baby face, and one nut that's in the middle. And three ways are always rotten, as we know, and you can't fucking get anybody over in them. And then they pull up the no disqualification thing, and then they book a rotten finish. Why was this done to this? I have no idea, other than it's what Vince wanted. Not that I'm against Daniel Bryan being in a great spot at WrestleMania, certainly not. But like you said, there was a natural well, was, story to be told with Edge. You put Daniel Bryan in a great spot at WrestleMania and then piss in his mouth when he gets there. Well, that is what ended up happening, yes. So, and I knew this was doomed from the ring announcer. Did you hear Reigns' introduction from the ring announcer? I don't recall. I wrote it down verbatim. Standing in at a weight of 265 pounds. <laughs> Yeah, standing in. Who was he standing in for? The real Roman Reigns? Did they pull a switch like they gave us the <laughs> fake warrior? Or the, the fake superstar Billy Graham? Anyway, so they start this match. And within 30 seconds, Jey Uso starts beating up Daniel Bryan in front of the referee. And guess what the announcer said, Bryan? No DQ. No DQ. When did they even say that this was going to be a no disqualification match in the advertising? Or did they just make it up the day of because they wanted to do these spots? When was this made a no disqualification match? I have no idea. Somebody out there is going, well, it's a triple threat match. So all of them are no, it's like a three way. All of them are no DQ or some shit like they. Now that they've they've gotten people's heads that you can win the title in a three-way without even beating the champion because it's first pin instead of elimination, which is the only thing that makes sense, now I guess it's all of them are also no disqualification, so they don't have to think of smart ideas. Speaking of smart ideas, this is the goddamn worst idea I ever had. If I'd have just left it w- one thing, I think, just for the goddamn fucking Christmas show... I'll never do it again. And then Heyman rips it off and JR starts asking about it. And here we are 30 years later. You can't fucking see anything else. All right. Um, So Jey Uso beats up Daniel Bryan in front of the referee within the first 30 seconds. And then it's no disqualification. Then they're all on the floor and Jey Uso's just freely involved. Within the first two minutes of the match, they're bouncing each other off the stairs in the barricade. Then Edge gives Uso a DDT on the metal stairs. And everyone is selling. There's no action at all. The EMTs come out and carry Uso off. This is rotten already. The camera at one point caught Roman Reigns looking up to see if they were ready for his next spot. Because they also, these three ways were the places where this got started what we've been talking about and now they just do it in every match where especially with no fans in the building or now and even if there's fans in the building guys just roll out and just sit at ringside out of view like actors leaving a stage when the scene doesn't include them and then they jump back in right when their next spot comes up so it, this is not they're not even having matches anymore they're just doing scenes Everybody's not participating all the way through. Um, Daniel Bryan versus Edge, very good stuff. Two tremendous talents. They could have had a singles match. Uh, That's when the announcer, while they're working with each other, that's where the announcers mentioned that Roman Reigns could lose the title if Edge beats Daniel Bryan, which points out why they should never book these fucking stupid matches again. It doesn't work. It's fucking stupid. If you're going to have a multiple person match in elimination is the only way it makes sense. And I know a lot of people out there that have been brainwashed by people in 
positions of power in wrestling these days will say, well, no, that's to leave more, more avenues for stories open and so-and-so can lose without ever being defeated, which leads to a rematch. No, that's just what the people that have been doing this shit have told the people that work for them and made them believe it. Roman Reigns suplexes Daniel Bryan. He'll disappear for five minutes so Edge and Roman Reigns can fight. I'd like to have seen a single match between Edge and Roman Reigns. That would have been nice. I could have seen the single match between Daniel Bryan and Roman Reigns, which you said was very good on their last pay-per-view, but I tuned it out uh, after they did all the other stupid shit that came before that that made me not want to see any of their product anymore. So all these guys can work, but they when they start out the match, the second freely interferes in front of the referee. It's a three-way to begin with. The furniture, the big injury angle in the first two minutes. At that point, I'm just waiting for this to be over with because it's the same as everything. It's the same thing you see constantly. And Paul Heyman is the manager, and he never interferes. He doesn't even pull a fucking leg. He doesn't even walk around the ring. He just stands there with his hand over half of his face. He'd have to have hands the size of Andre to put a hand completely over his fucking face. And, and he looks worried and gets bug eyes when his guy's getting beat up. Can you remember a time he has interfered, passed an object, no. pulled a leg, come in and distracted the referee and or the, the baby face and taken a bump from the baby face so the heel can come from behind? He got one chance and he couldn't unlock handcuffs. No, with him, it's it's all facial reactions now, and I don't think he's taken a bump since 94, 95. I know a young lady that uh, used to tell me some of his shortcomings, and she never said that he couldn't unlock handcuffs. But and it, it, oh. the thing is, I know, I'm not suggesting that he take like power slams and suplexes and whatever the fuck, but if you, that's one of the reasons why I don't manage anymore. I got to the point where I don't want to take any more fucking bumps because I'll hurt myself. But if you're not going to take bumps, don't manage. And Paul has, Paul has never had an injury. He's never had a surgery. Think about well, when, Lawler did break his jaw. Okay, that's that wasn't surgery. It was an injury, but you know, so did he. Jimmy Hart too, same thing. But you get over those. But Paul had as an active manager. He started in what eighty seven, and he yeah. wasn't even really managing and bumping in ECW after he took over the book. So six years. So he never had any injuries. He never had any surgeries. He ought to be able to goddamn fall down now once in a while. I could still do it if I wanted to. For that much money, I'd take a fucking bump. But anyway, I don't... So the flunky Jey Uso just does everything in front of the referee, including, you know, bringing goddamn bludgeons to the ring and whacking people, but the manager that's supposed to interfere never does. Uh... Oh, Wait. Everything came to a halt again while Roman Reigns set up stairs in front of the desk and then slowly brought Daniel Bryan up and power bombed him on the table. But then Edge speared Roman Reigns off the steps and everything comes to a halt again as they're all laying on the ground. And that's when the announcers say, well, there's no count outs. Uh, Edge put Re Reigns back in the ring after Edge speared Roman Reigns off the stairs. Boom, and everybody's selling. Then Edge puts, throws him back in the ring where he can beat him, but he doesn't get back in the ring. He goes out, out back of the announce desk and starts grabbing chairs. What, what? You just hit the fucking champion. You've thrown him in the ring. Go for a fucking cover. No, I'll throw him in the ring and then I'll go find some more furniture. Why do you need the extra furniture? You might could have beat him there. The whole thing had been over with. You ever think about that? So he brings in multiple chairs, but then Reigns grabs a chair. And it this if this spot was planned, actually, they, they, they did it very well because Reigns grabs the chair. They have a little tug of war and Edge, it, it, Reigns pulls the chair away from Edge, but Edge ends up with one of the metal bars from the chair in his hand. And then he looks like for a second, like, oh, shit, how did I get this? And then he drops it because he's not supposed to have a fucking metal club in his hand. 
while Reigns is on offense. But then later on, when he gets the cross face on Edge, he gets the piece of chair and puts or um, Reigns gets the piece of chair and puts it in Reigns' mouth with a cr- cross face on him. Uh, and then Daniel Bryan comes back in and gets the cross face on the other side. And then Bryan and Edge start fighting with each other while they're holding dueling cross faces on Roman Reigns from uh, Edge has great facials. I'll say that. I think he but, looks great here now, like as an old gruff yeah, edge. Yeah. He looks he, like an old guy who kick your ass. He looks like an he looks like an old mean man, like yeah. some of the boys used to look like before they started working to where you couldn't do this after you're fucking 35. Um, but he kept throwing the chairs in the ring, and th- this would not end because it was <sighs> Edge hit Reigns five times and Daniel Bryan four times with a chair just pulling back and Paul Bunyan and Paul Bunyaning them, but didn't go for a cover at all. You're in a match for the world championship. That's your goal coming back to the sport that you had to goddamn retire from due to doctor's intervention. And now you've got a chair in your hand. The referee's doing absolutely nothing about it. And you've pummeled into powder the champion and your other opponent, and you don't go for a cover. You get back out of the ring and go find more chairs. And then you get in the ring and you put a chair under Roman Reigns' head and a chair under under Daniel Bryan's head, and they leave their heads on those chairs when you walk away from them to pick up another chair both of them were motionless and could have been pinned easily in the, in the state of, of physical condition that they were in. But no, they're leaving their heads on the chairs. Edge goes to get another chair, and he does, what do they call it? The concerto, that was a thing he and Christian used to do. It was stupid then. I love both those guys, but it was stupid then because unless the goddamn guy instantly, his head explodes in a bloody clot, and you never see him again. It was fake. So he he hit a concerto on Daniel Bryan that was fake. Usos back in the ring. He was taken out by a goddamn DDT on on the stairs, but he's back now. But Edge beats him with the chair. Then Roman Reigns hits Edge with a spear. Reigns puts Edge's head on a chair. He leaves it there. And Reigns picks up the chair and gives him the worst-looking one because you could tell he didn't hit the head. They're hitting the chair to chair to make the noise. But there's no way to sell it. You can't take a bump. You don't want to move and throw the guy's margin of error off. So basically... When they get their head caved in with a fucking chair, they kick their feet up. Just kick your feet up, baby. And then he carried Edge over and put him on top of Daniel Bryan and pinned both of them like Andre used to pin fucking Mario Mancini and John Anthony in handicap matches. Besides the concertos looking fake as fuck, Could there be a worse finish to make the fans mad at the company, make Daniel Bryan and Edge both look like shit, not get heat on Roman Reigns, and leave this taste in the live fans' mouths after they spent a fortune to sit out in the rain for six hours? What do you think? I wasn't a big fan of uh, aspects of this match, and I was surprised by the finish. Not only that Roman Reigns won and retained, but the method in which he pinned both guys, that was surprising. I'm not a big fan of all the Jay Uso interfering, but I agree with a lot of what you just said. That's And again, if it had been Reigns and Edge with the Cinderella story, Edge could have done the job, and it wouldn't have hurt him because people would have still reckoned, oh, God damn, he's 47 years old, and he came back after. Good for him. What a match. Because it would have been better as a single match. Or they could have had a fucking, well, I, don't, I, I wouldn't have had Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan again. But 
the fans, once again, the fans couldn't be mad at the heels in this because they were doing everything right in front of the referee as part of the lack of any kind of parameters or rules in this clusterfuck they were in. So the heels can't get any heat. Um, the baby faces or the baby face ends up looking like shit because he's on the bottom of the pile that got set on by Andre's ass and just pinned like a turd in a punch bowl. Um, it didn't really get any heat on Roman Reigns for the obvious reasons. Cause it was a bad finish and cause Jey Uso was allowed to freely interfere in front of the referee. Just visually it looked bad, left a bad taste in people's mouths. The heel went over at the climactic point of the second and last night of WrestleMania. So the people leaving the stadium are going, oh, yeah, that was a flat fucking finish and nothing really happened. Even if they'd have put edge over in a Cinderella story out of nowhere to give people the, you know, where they'd, you know, skip on off into the night, into the parking lot, happy as, you know, a pig and shit, and then take it off of him a month later, that would have been better. Uh, but nobody came out of this to me looking even as good as they did when they went in. Night one started and night two ended the same way with the heel champion coming out victorious. <sighs> so there you have it. I can't even, I took so many notes. I can't even tear this all in one day. It looked like Bobby Heaton trying to tear a phone book. Save so I'll it. just, I'll just tear Will you stop? You care about history. You should stop ripping this stuff up. This is. Important. Oh, nobody's ever going to look at this again. I wouldn't oh, people even would love to look at it. Again. People would love to look at it. Well, I got some other things people can love to look at. Well, they could do that on your OnlyFans page, but people want to see your notes for all these. Things. You know, hey, and here's another thing: if people think that women get the short end of the stick, they sure can make money on OnlyFans a whole lot easier than guys can. They got advantages. <laughs> I guess so. I didn't expect this rant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just saying. You know, everybody, everybody's got it, their own type of advantages, but women are just not completely helpless and defenseless. They can make money on OnlyFans, and they never have to work at getting laid. And also, of course, I don't know how I'm going to transition to Stephen P. from this. <laughs> <laughs> of course, they also can sue a big corporation like 3M when they get screwed over. Oh, for heaven's sake, just admit it. Just admit it. You want to just go into the Stephen P. News spot now, and why shouldn't we? Ladies and gentlemen, here he is. Play that funky music. Call Stephen P. To the rest. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, whether you're upset over being sold a bill of goods on a wrestling pay per view or whether you got real troubles in your life, like uh, an elder family member, the victim of nursing home abuse, whether a major corporation has poisoned the water source in your town, whether the Veterans Administration hospital doctor has assaulted. You are a member of your family. Stephen P. New is in all of this stuff because he doesn't like it when people take advantage of the little guy and want to walk all over him. And he fights for your rights. Newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. He's become not only a celebrity, but also a paragon, a shining light of legal jurisprudence in a world of shadiness. You know that Stephen P. New is a t an attorney you can trust. You know, a lot of times people ask the question, why does a snake not bite a lawyer? And the answer is professional courtesy. But in this case, Stephen P. New is one of us, a member of the cult of Cornette, a longtime wrestling fan, and one of the little people that wants to make sure those big people don't push the little people around. So if you have any problems or any issues or know someone in your family or social circle that does, because Brian, we've gotten umpty seven emails since Stephen has been a part of the program saying, you know, I heard your guys spot and I just talked to my aunt who had a problem with the nursing home, or I just talked to my grandmother who said that my grandfather had been diagnosed with so-and-so. And then we hear about the class action suit. 
So a lot of the cult members have put non-wrestling family members or friends in their immediate circle onto Stephen P. New without even knowing about his sparkling reputation in the wrestling profession. Anyway, Stephen P. New, newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. That's right. That's right. Not a 808-8084. It's just 8084. 8084. But let's get a, at least one question here. I have Well, I have one thing here I've just seen here. Oh. And I wanted to read this. It's a hypothetical statement. And, and we always try to read the hypothetical statements toward the end of the program. The subject line is hypothetical statement on stimulant treatment of attention deficit, parentheses, hyperactive disorder. Because we mentioned... I guess, how can we say it in a nice way? We have no proof of this, but a lot of people saying it. That Tony Khan and or whoever's behind the, the you know, chaos over at AEW television are on some kind of drugs. And I mentioned, I said, you know, I thought that attention deficit disorder drug that a lot of the kids take these days, if you have attention deficit disorder, that means you have a lack of attention, you have a deficit of it, you can't focus. So it seems like if if you were taking medicine to counteract that, that you would be able to focus and make shit make sense better than if you were just, you know, not drugged and had this disorder. But apparently that's not always the case. We have this um, email that has come in. He says, hello, Jim and Brian. I have not a question, rather a purely philosophical insight on the use of amphetamine based prescription medication. I know this is not my show whose rules I may casually flaunt. However, I have insight towards a relevant topic at the moment and hope to share. Disclaimer, this insight is in no way accusatory towards any living person, including professional wrestling bookers, nor the author of this email. Let's just say I used to work with a speed freak who liked to share his or her experiences. Nod wink. Pharmaceutical ADD, ADHD medication is essentially speed of the highest order. In many ways, it is fantastic, a human marvel. It is likely the closest substance to a limitless drug with responsible use and moderately healthy living and sleep cycling. One's brain is stimulated by an alert, focused, and creative deluge of electricity. Such drugs, of course, come with implicit costs that can lead to Jim's favorite economic concept, the law of diminishing returns. Predictably, high order speed works as an even higher order stimulant, allowing the brain and body to work past normal, perhaps even healthy limits, a fact unfortunately not lost on the Germans during World War II. I've seen that on the History Channel. In short, these pills are highly addictive to the point of abuse. Such abuse can cause a person to spiral mentally and or physically over time higher and or more frequent doses are counteracted by loss of sleep among other negative effects the lack of sleep alone can obviously wreak severe havoc upon a human brain especially in medium to long-term time periods so yes add medicine does improve focus except when it makes you so crazy that focus isn't even a biological possibility disclaimer the author does not believe nor intend to suggest that Tony Khan is either an amphetamine addict nor a Nazi. <laughs> However, the author absolutely declares that Tony Khan is an imposter of everything that he purports to be with respect to professional wrestling and entirely unaware of self. To sum up in another decidedly more markish way, dude, Tony, get some fucking sleep. Rich guys are supposed to live to be like a hundred. Thank you, fuck you, bye, Matt from Memphis, Tennessee. I love it when we have letters from the listeners. Seems to be a rather informed listener about this subject. Well, let's see. You were about to ask a question and play some song. I was going to ask at least one question and play at least one song. This email, are you ripping it up? What are you doing I'm now? I'm not ripping it up, just crumpling. Crumpling's not as, as violent as ripping. Okay, this is some news here. We now know there's a rip pile and a crumpled pile. Yeah, well, see, it's it's stages. First you, first you just crumple, then you rip, and then finally you either burn or flush. Eating the notes doesn't work. We've learned that recently on the show. Let's find out what will happen to this email. Sent to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Ted Marsh. I recently read a book 
Sleep, My Child Forever, about Ellen Bohm, a mother and NWA superfan who murdered two of her children for life insurance money in the late 80s. What? According to the book, this lady traveled around the country attending NWA shows and was well known to the wrestlers, even having a quasi relationship with Paul Ellering. What? I was wondering if you were familiar with this case or had any memories of Ellen Bohm. I've never heard the name. I don't, I mean, I, as far as just random women traveling around the matches, that, yeah, that could be any number of people. But I have, I don't know what this woman looks like. I don't, uh, I don't remember Paul ever saying, you know, there was that time that uh, I was fucking around with this serial killer. I don't remember that. You got any pictures? I don't have any pictures. Somebody, though. okay, folks, send the pictures, put the pictures out there, uh, send them to us, email, Twitter, whatever. Who is this Ellen Bohm and what does she look like? All right, well, let's end on a different question <laughs> since we got nowhere quickly that time. No, but we got there quick. That's the most important part. This next question sent to Corny Drive Through at gmail.com from Justin in Connecticut. Is Vince at his best when he's producing someone else's ideas? You look at the most successful times of WWE, he was always producing someone else's ideas. For instance, Pritchard and Cornette, Russo and Ferrara, Paul Heyman, etc. Patterson. Vince's original ideas gave us gobbledygooker, Isaac Yankum, Million Dollar Mania, Katie Vick, and Fake Diesel. Is Vince McMahon the Rick Rubin of wrestling? Now, what? Why would Better that... at producing someone else than being the artist himself. Okay, well, I don't know if Rubin ever tried to be an artist. I don't know if he can play any instrument. He was a um, DJ. He was, that's how Def Jam started. He was a DJ. Well, but that's and just playing other people's shit. But it's putting it in a new way to create a new song. Horseshit. Whether or not you pay for the royalties to use the song you're sampling. Hey, I like what Ruben told me one time when I said, "Should we? are we going to get in trouble if we don't pay any royalties on this music we're using on Smoky Mountain Wrestling? He said, I make rap records. We take other people's music and sell it. Just do it until somebody tells you not to. <laughs> anyway, um, well, I mean, yeah, that kind of, actually, that question, the answer is yes. and. It's not even as something you need to think about as long as you might think. Vince Vince was never a booker in that he would figure out a program and he would start it with this angle and it would be over this issue or he would come up with a finish. It would put one foot in front of another finish rather than, yeah, the finish, I want to see him fuck him. Okay, well, everybody can come up with that, but exactly how? Vince sees the big picture. Vince sees talent. Vince sees things he can promote. Like I said, whether it be the WrestleMania main event that used to be the most important thing in his life is what's the main event for WrestleMania? I want to know it if I can a year out, certainly three to six months, have it set in stone by then. And he agonized over the thought. And when he would rethink things, remember when 97, the worst WrestleMania by rate of all time, but he he didn't get what he wanted with Brett and Sean because they were having their shit, and he went back to the big guys, and we got Taker and Diesel, and that sucked. Um, or not ninety seven, but uh, goddamn, what was it? Ninety seven, Taker and Sid is what I'm trying to say. Um, so yes, he's better producing other people's ideas because then. If you have guys that can come up with finishes, or if you have guys that can come up with angles, or if you have guys that do say, well, I've done this in the past or that in the past, because Vince was never a performer, as we all know, until the Attitude Era. So he didn't have, you know, most bookers were wrestlers, or at least were performers in the business. And so they had a mental Rolodex of finishes they'd been involved in, angles they had done, things they'd seen in the territories they'd worked, whatever. Vince never watched any other wrestling besides his. He obviously saw plenty of WWWF, but that led to repetition over time. And WWWF style booking was repetitious to begin with. So 
Pat Patterson was an entirely new way for him to look at things in the mid 80s and 90s. And then whether it was Bruce or me or even shit stain, it was a different way of looking at shit. That's for sure. But he always did that with everybody that was working with him. And he would pick out the things that he liked the best to make the final say as the boss. And then he usually liked the things that he, in his mind could see This is the tagline. This is the promotion. This is the promotional push. Uh, You know, the 4th of July, yeah, he'll he'll slam the evil foreign giant on the deck of the Intrepid for the 4th of July, and then we'll get him a bus and dress him in red, white, and blue. Vince had promotional ideas like that. Vince didn't have wrestling ideas. So the wrestling was all had to be done by the wrestlers and his staff. Um, how would you compare? I'm I'm sorry. I I was just going to say, I don't think I ever heard Vince say, this is a finish I want to do. And then call an actual finish. Like you do in a locker room. I don't think I ever heard it once. How would you compare Vince with this process to Bill Watts? Cause although Bill Watts was an extremely talented booker and had had great success, look at what he did in Florida. When you were in mid South and for several years before that, and after that, he had a booker. So how would you compare him producing? His booker to Vince producing his. Well, but uh, see, there's the, it, almost completely the opposite to the point where Watts was usually a better booker than his booker. So what it would be was Watts would have a booker because he got to the point, he had been a booker for other people. He booked Atlanta. He booked Florida. He booked for Leroy McGurk. But when you're running the company and you own the whole thing and you don't want to be on the road anymore going to the towns every night, that's when you hire a booker, but it may kind of like be Rick Rubin hiring an assistant producer just to, you know, if, or an if, engineer or, or some an of the engineer, credit that engineer gets yeah, an engineer because yeah. And the guy gets an engineer credit because Rubin still, he's the producer. Watts ran his and Watts was the complete opposite of Vince in that sometimes If it didn't work for him wrestling wise, he wouldn't care whether he could promote it or not because it didn't work for him wrestling wise. It wasn't something that he thought that he should promote as wrestling or the people would buy. He wasn't, he was wanting to get the wrestling right and then promote what the wrestling was. Whereas Vince didn't give a fuck about whether the talent was going to have a good match or whether the angle was going to be believable or whatever, as long as he could figure out a way to promote it and get people to buy it, the sizzle over the steak. Watts was a lot of steak and a little sizzle. Vince was a lot of sizzle and very little steak. They had com- two completely different philosophies about how to go about it, but they were able to work together that brief time it, because they respected each other's various talents and and success they'd had. But then in the end, in that situation, Vince had to have the final say, and Watts was not going to coexist put up with or acquiesce to that somebody overruling him about wrestling and and that's when he said you know okay vince in that case i'm going home because there's only room for one titan and titan sports we're not mad we're not fighting but you you know the same thing in atlanta they said he had the final say and then he found out he didn't have the final say and you will find with perfectionists and people that I mean, let's face it. Bill Watts was probably at the time in the eighties. Um, if not the best booker in the business, one of the best two or three. And you, when you find people that are confident in their ability and not only know that they're the best at what they do, but have a track record of it, they don't want to be told anything different in their specialty. And so that's why they prefer to do their own thing rather than things for other people because it's too much fucking headache dumbing your shit down for the people you're working for. And by the way, as as as, as you can tell, I've experienced a bit of that myself. I was going to say, who would a booker become more frustrated at working under, Vince or Watts? Vince. Vince. 
Vince was always frustrating to work under, even when he was nice to you, because goddamn the the last minute mind changes and just the things that he comes up with. And he said, okay, this is our mystery. Now, you know, after I've already written the crime for you, you solve it. Well, uh, Vince is more frustrated for a booker. Watts would demand perfection, but you would learn so much about the actual booking that it, to me, it would be fun. It would, it would be fun. It wouldn't be a, a, a chore at all, even though, you know, you would be expected to produce or you'd be out on your ear. But again, I mean, I, I didn't work in the, the office with Watts, but I worked as a talent for Bill Watts for a year. And it was never frustrating. I never learned so much in one compact period about the wrestling business in my life. Whereas Vince be very fucking frustrating. I learned tons about promotion and television and dealing with things like that from Vince. I never learned anything about wrestling from Vince McMahon, not wrestling itself or the performance of it, but promotion of it, television, broadcasting of it, formatting of it. Yes, but not anything about wrestling. Well, with that, the WrestleMania edition of the drive through is closed. Of course, you can hear us on the Jim Cornette Experience when the new episode debuts this Saturday. I know that feeling quite well. And of course, the drive through back with you next Tuesday, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Get access to classic episodes of the drive through and the experience by becoming a patron. Patreon.com slash Cornette. For and hey, when you get your action figures in the mail this week, tweet out a picture of them to give other people hope. Hashtag it can happen to you. Remember, I want to make sure people know I'm actually sending these things out. Patreon.com slash Cornette. The official I'm sorry, I interrupted your plug. I was going to get to Cornette's collectibles. Well, I was afraid you were taking too long. You know, the figure doesn't have a tennis racket. You should have like a version that packs boxes. So the figure can pack boxes of itself. Wait till you see what we got coming up for 2022. Oh, what a tease there. And we're not even at Cornette's Collectibles yet. The official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. And thank you to all of our subscribers and everyone checking out the videos. Over 206,000 subscribers and growing strong. Becoming one of them today. Check out the exclusive Travis Heckle artwork and so much more the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. You can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at great Brian last. You can hear me on the 605 super podcast at 605 pod.com available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Cornette's collectibles at Jim It's closed. It's closed, but you got your figure update and give us your figure update. Tweeting photos of the figure. What's the hashtag, Jim? It can happen to you. It you got to give these people you. hope because it's going to be another three or four weeks before I get through everything. Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com. The drive through is brought to you by the law office of Stephen P. New, 888 692 8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until Friday, Wrong until Saturday on The Experience and Tuesday right back here on the drive-thru for Jim Cornette. I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho!